Hello, everyone, and welcome to the 163rd episode of Analyzing Evil, featuring Sauron from the Tolkien Legendarium. Well, it's been a long time coming, and it's finally here, the Sauron episode. And it's only fitting that the longest video I've made yet is centered around a Dark Lord who uses a lidless eye as his symbol. Now some of you, especially those of you who have never read The Silmarillion, might be wondering why this video is so long, considering that Sauron doesn't really appear all too much personally in either The Hobbit or The Lord of the Rings, even if he is the titular Lord of the Rings. Well, that's because just like with my Morgoth video, much of this video consists of text that I've taken directly from four different sources. The Silmarillion, The Hobbit, The Lord of the Rings, and Morgoth's Ring, Volume 10 of the History of Middle-Earth text that I'll be reading for you to provide you with all the necessary details on Sauron's character while I weave in some of my own commentary on him. The works of J.R.R. Tolkien are very near and dear to my heart, and while reading large portions of source material pertaining to the character I'm discussing for you allows you to better follow along with my analysis, my primary reason for reading text to you in full is that I feel it's best that any detail or description of Tolkien's characters, or any other author for that matter, is best described the way they intended them to be described. However, considering there are many characters or places you may not be familiar with, I will be providing some descriptions of them and altering the text slightly when appropriate. Also, considering most people are only familiar with either the films or The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings novels, I figured it would be best to provide you with every ounce of information I could find on Sauron, both so you can better understand the evil inherent to his character and so you can perhaps learn some new information about this timeless villain that you might not have known prior to viewing or listening to this video. As let's be honest, if I only dedicated this video to a brief overview of Sauron's crime, history, and his overall character, it would be perhaps a quarter of the length it is now, maybe less. But as generic as it may be, Tolkien is one of my personal heroes, and the universe he created and the stories he crafted are without a doubt my all-time favorite. And if I can do more to bring the many, many details of some of his creations that aren't in The Hobbit or Lord of the Rings books and films to people who might not be aware of them, then I consider that an honor. So yes, if you're a Tolkien superfan like myself, and you've read The Silmarillion or other works detailing what I've included in this video, a lot of what I'm reading here might be a tad redundant for you, which is why I've included timestamps for you to skip over anything that you might not want to hear again for the 30th time. With that in mind, much of who Sauron is and where he came from is directly tied to the story of his former master, Melkor, the Morgoth upon Arda, and so I would advise you to watch the video I made on Morgoth prior to viewing this one, a link to which you should see on your screen now. However, if you're not interested in Morgoth, it's not necessary that you watch that video before going any further with this one, but it would go a long way in helping you better understand the excerpts I'll be reading from the sources I named earlier if you aren't familiar with the intricacies of all of them. Now with that out of the way, let's start talking about Sauron, as we have a long journey ahead of us. Sauron's origins can be traced back to the very beginnings of this universe. Like the Wizards of Great Renown and the Balrogs of Dread Infamy, Sauron was a Maiar, a lesser member of the race of divine beings known as the Ainur, that were created through the Flame Imperishable by Eru Iluvatar, the one true god of the Tolkien Legendarium. And here, at this beginning, long before he was known as Sauron the Dark and Terrible, he was called Myron, which means the Admirable in Sindarin, the Elven Tongue. In the beginning, like all Ainur, Myron dwelt outside the known universe that here is called Ea in the timeless halls of Eru, and here he and his brethren made their contributions to the music of the Ainur, the great song that brought Ea into existence. When the music had subsided and this new realm lay before the Ainur, many chose to reside with Eru in the timeless halls, but more still chose to go into Ea and dwell in this new world to order it and make further marks upon it as they awaited the coming of the children of Iluvatar, those children being elves and men. When Myron came into Ea, he dwelt amongst the other Maiar and their overlords the Valar in the then shapeless and formless world that is called Arda, upon which the continent we know as Middle-earth would later be formed, and here he pledged himself to the Valar Aule the Smith, father of the dwarves, creator of stone, gem, and mineral, and master of all crafts and forging. Under his tutelage, he became a mighty craftsman whose skill was only rivaled by Aule himself. Now every Ainur was born from Eru's thoughts, each crafted from a portion of his mind from which they then derived their personality and talents. That part of Eru's mind was of course that which had to do with creation and crafting, but also of order, planning, and coordination. The latter traits would end up being what drew Myron to the magnanimous force of Melkor, the mightiest of all the Valar, and the first Dark Lord, who would later only be known as Morgoth. We're given the following musing on Myron's fall in Morgoth's ring. It had been his virtue, and therefore also the cause of his fall, and of his relapse, that he loved order and coordination, and disliked all confusion and wasteful friction. It was the apparent will and power of Melkor to effect his designs quickly and masterfully that had first attracted Sauron to him. 
The orderly Myron, though an admirer and an adherent to the craftsmanship of Aule that sought to reorder raw elements into new and wondrous forms, could not help his attraction to a force so mighty and so powerful that could impose its will upon anything it set its eyes on. And through Melkor, Myron saw the chance for him to bring order to this new world far more efficiently and effectively than he could have by pledging himself to any of the other Valar. And so, by the time the Spring of Arda commenced, that is, the peacetime that occurred following the first war between the Valar and Melkor ended, Myron became the chief Maiar allied to Melkor, and until shortly after Melkor extinguished the two lamps and destroyed the Isle of Almoren, the original sources of light upon Arda, and the first home of the Valar, Myron served as a spy feeding him information about the Valar and their plans. Once the lamps were destroyed, and Melkor held dominion over Arda during a period of extended darkness, Myron left Valinor to openly swear fealty to his lord and master, becoming his most trusted and valued ally and servant. A being who then and ever after was referred to as either Gorthaur, meaning terrible dread in Sindarin, or Sauron, meaning the abhorred. Though until after the downfall of Numenor, which we'll get into later, he continued to refer to himself as Myron, or Tar Myron, meaning King Excellent. Sauron was given command of Angband, the second mightiest fortress built by Morgoth next to Atumno, and from his high seat in that dreaded place, Sauron worked on his master's behalf during this dark age to corrupt the creatures of Middle-earth to his cause, and ruin all that the Valar had wrought. But when the time came for the elves to awaken in Arda, and the Valar came to wage war upon Melkor and his host to protect them by sacking Angband and Utumno, Sauron was forced to go into hiding, after the Valar were unable to capture him. And after they had departed back to Valinor with the chain Melkor in tow, Sauron re-emerged at the ruins of Angband, and he long dwelt there rebuilding its power, in anticipation of his master's return. And return he did. After Melkor, now forever known as Morgoth, defiled the two trees of Valinor with Ungoliant, and stole the Silmarils, he returned to Arda, and sought refuge in Angband, which he now made his chief residence. For the many years after Morgoth's return, Sauron would endeavor to aid him in any way that he could, whether that be in battle, or elsewhere, which included guiding the war effort against the elves, whilst Morgoth went out into the world to try and corrupt men upon their awakening. However, we know precious little of his activities during this time period. What we do know of his deeds, I'll read for you now. But at length, after the fall of Fingolfin, first high king of the Noldoran elves, Sauron, greatest and most terrible of the servants of Morgoth, came against Orodreth, the warden of the tower upon Tolsirian. Sauron was become now a sorcerer of dreadful power, master of shadows and of phantoms, foul in wisdom, cruel in strength, misshaping what he touched, twisting what he ruled, lord of werewolves. His dominion was torment. He took Minas Tirith by assault, for a dark cloud of fear fell upon those that defended it, and Ordreth was driven out, and fled to Nargothrond. Then Sauron made it into a watchtower for Morgoth, a stronghold of evil, and a menace, and the fair Isle of Tolsirian became accursed, and it was called Tolingarhoth, the Isle of Werewolves. No living creature could pass through that veil that Sauron did not espy from the tower where he sat, and Morgoth held now the western pass, and his terror filled the fields and woods of Beleriand. This is one of Sauron's greatest documented misdeeds of this era, and through the description of this crime, we're given some insight into what kind of horrid creature Sauron was even in the early age of this world. But this is not the only dark undertaking of Sauron's that we're aware of during the First Age, and this act led to another of his misdeeds, the part he played in the tale of Baron and Luthien. The first part he played in this story lies in the mission he was given by Morgoth to finish off the Lord of Men Barahir and his last twelve remaining companions, after Barahir refused to leave Dorthonian following Morgoth's conquest of the region. It has been told that Barahir would not forsake Dorthonian, and there Morgoth pursued him to the death, until at last there remained to him only twelve companions. Now the forest of Dorthonian rose southward into mountainous moors, and in the east of those highlands there lay a lake, Tarnaluin, with wild heaths about it, and all that land was pathless and untamed, for even in the days of the long peace, none had dwelt there. But the waters of Tarnaluin were held in reverence, for they were clear and blue by day, and by night were a mirror for the stars. And it was said that Melian herself, that is, the Maiar wife of King Thingol of the realm of Doriath, lord of the Teleri, and Sindarin elves, had hallowed that water in days of old. Thither Barahir and his outlaws withdrew, and there made their lair, and Morgoth could not discover it. But the rumor of the deeds of Barahir and his companions went far and wide, and Morgoth commanded Sauron to find them and destroy them. Now among the companions of Barahir was Gorlim, son of Angrim. His wife was named Ilanel, and their love was great, ere evil befell. But Gorlim, returning from the war upon the marches, found his house plundered and forsaken, and his wife gone. Whether slain or taken, he knew not. Then he fled to Barahir, and of his companions he was the most fierce and desperate, but doubt not his heart, thinking that perhaps Ilanel was not dead. At times he would depart alone and secretly, and visit his house that still stood amid the fields and woods he had once possessed. And this became known to the servants of Morgoth. 
On a time of autumn he came in the dusk of evening, and drawing near he saw as he thought, a light at the window, and coming warily he looked within. There he saw Ilanel, and her face was worn with grief and hunger, and it seemed to him that he heard her voice lamenting that he had forsaken her. But even as he cried aloud, the light was blown out in the wind. Wolves howled, and on his shoulders he felt suddenly the heavy hands of Sauron's hunters. Thus Gorlim was ensnared, and taking him to their camp they tormented him, seeking to learn the hidings of Barahir and all his ways. But nothing would Gorlim tell. Then they promised him that he should be released and restored to Ilanel, if he would yield. And being at last worn with pain, and yearning for his wife, he faltered. Then straight away they brought him into the dreadful presence of Sauron. And Sauron said, I hear now that thou wouldst barter with me. What is thy price? And Gorlim answered that he should find Ilanel again, and with her be set free. For he thought that Ilanel also had been made captive. Then Sauron smiled, saying, That is a small price for so great a treachery. So shall it surely be. Say on. Now Gorlim would have drawn back, but daunted by the eyes of Sauron, he told at last all that he would know. Then Sauron laughed and he mocked Gorlim, and he revealed to him that he had seen only a phantom devised by wizardry to entrap him, for Ilanel was dead. Nonetheless, I will grant thy prayer, said Sauron, and thou shalt go to Ilanel and be set free of my service. Then he put him cruelly to death. In this way, the hiding of Barahir was revealed, and Morgoth drew his net about it, and the orcs coming in the still hours before dawn surprised the men of Dorthonion, and slew them all, save one. This is the first time canonically that we see Sauron using one of his greatest traits, manipulation, and the cruelty with which he led Gorlim astray is but a shadow of the sinister cunning that this fledgling master of evil possessed. After his trickery of Gorlim had played out, Sauron returned to Tolan Gaurhoth to await further orders from his lord. And when Baron, son of Barahir, was sent on his labor of love to retrieve a Silmaril from the crown of Morgoth to earn the maiden Luthien's hand, daughter of Eluthingol and Melian, Sauron waylaid him and his party thusly. On an evening of autumn, Felagund, that is Finrod Felagund, Noldoran prince and king of Nargothrond, who was the son of Finarfin, son of Finwë, and half-brother to Feanor, creator of the Silmarils, set out with Baron from Nargothrond with their ten companions, and they journeyed beside the river Naurog to his source in the falls of Ivrin. Beneath the shadowy mountains, they came upon a company of orcs, and slew them all in their camp by night, and they took their gear and their weapons. By the arts of Felagund, their own forms and faces were changed into the likeness of orcs. And thus disguised, they came far upon their northward road, and ventured into the western pass between Arid Wethrin and the highlands of Tower Nufuin. But Sauron in his tower was aware of them, and doubt took him, for they went in haste, and stayed not to report their deeds, as was commanded to all the servants of Morgoth that passed that way. Therefore he sent them to waylay them, and bring them before him. Thus befell the contest of Sauron and Felagund, which is renowned. For Felagund strove with Sauron in songs of power, and the power of the king was very great. But Sauron had the mastery, as is told in the Lay of Lathian. He chanted a song of wizardry, of piercing, opening, of treachery, revealing, uncovering, betraying. Then sudden Felagund there swaying sang in answer a song of staying, resisting, battling against power, of secrets kept, strength like a tower, and trust unbroken, freedom, escape, of changing and of shifting shape, of snares eluded, broken traps, the prison opening, the chain that snaps. Backwards and forwards swayed their song, reeling and foundering, as ever more strong the chanting swelled, Felagund fought, and all the magic and might he brought of Elveness into his words. Softly in the gloom they heard the birds singing afar in Nargothrond, the sighing of the sea beyond, beyond the western world, on sand of pearls, in elven land. Then the gloom gathered, darkness growing in Valinor, the blessed realm of the Valar, the red blood flowing beside the sea, where the Noldor slew the foam riders, and stealing drew their white ships with their white sails from lamplit havens. The wolf howls, the ravens flee, the ice mutters in the mouth of the sea, the captive sad and angband mourn, thunder rumbles, the fires burn, and Finrod fell before the throne. Then Sauron stripped from them their disguise, and they stood before him naked and afraid. But though their kinds were revealed, Sauron could not discover their names or their purposes. He cast them, therefore, into a deep pit, dark and silent, and he threatened to slay them cruelly, unless one would betray the truth to him. From time to time they saw two eyes kindled in the dark, and a werewolf devoured one of their companions, but none betrayed their lord. The next part of this tale tells of Luthien's escape from her home in search of Baron, and as this portion of the story doesn't hold much importance as far as Sauron's character is concerned, we're going to skip ahead a bit here. In the pits of Sauron, Baron and Felagund lay, and all their companions were now dead. But Sauron purposed to keep Felagund to the last, for he perceived that he was a Noldo of great might and wisdom, and he deemed that in him lay the secret of their errand. But when the wolf came for Baron, 
Felagun put forth all his power, and burst his bonds, and he wrestled with the werewolf, and slew it with his hands and teeth, yet he himself was wounded to the death. Then he spoke to Baron, saying, I go now to my long rest in the timeless halls beyond the seas in the mountains of Amman. It will be long ere I am seen among the Noldor again, and it may be that we shall not meet a second time in death or life, for the fates of our kindreds are apart. Farewell. He died then in the dark, in Tolin Garhoth, whose great tower he himself had built. Thus King Finrod Felagund, fairest and most beloved of the house of Finway, redeemed his oath. But Baron mourned beside him in despair. In that hour Luthien came, and standing upon the bridge that led to Sauron's isle, she sang a song that no walls of stone could hinder. Baron heard, and he thought that he dreamed, for the stars shone above him, and in the trees, nightingales were singing. And in answer he sang a song of challenge that he had made in praise of the seven stars, the sickle of the Valar that Varda hung upon the north, as a sign for the fall of Morgoth. Then all strength left him, and he fell down into darkness. But Luthien heard his answering voice, and she sang then a song of greater power. The wolves howled. Sauron stood in the high tower, wrapped in his black thought. But he smiled hearing her voice, for he knew that it was the daughter of Melian. The fame of the beauty of Luthien, and the wonder of her song, had long gone forth from Doriath, and he thought to make her captive and hand her over to the power of Morgoth, for his reward would be great. Therefore he sent a wolf to the bridge, but Huon, greatest of the hounds of Valinor, slew it silently. Still Sauron sent others one by one, and one by one, Huon took them by the throat and slew them. Then Sauron sent Draugluin, a dread beast, old and evil, lord and sire of the werewolves of Angband. His might was great, and the battle of Huon and Draugluin was long and fierce. Yet at length Draugluin escaped, and fleeing back into the tower he died before Sauron's feet. And as he died he told his master, Huon is there. Now Sauron knew well, as did all in that land, the fate that was decreed for the Hound of Valinor, and it came into his thought that he himself would accomplish it. Therefore he took upon himself the form of a werewolf, and made himself the mightiest that had yet walked the world, and he came forth to win the passage of the bridge. So great was the horror of his approach, that Huon leaped aside. Then Sauron sprang upon Luthien, and she swooned before the menace of the fell spirit in his eyes, and the foul vapor of his breath. But even as he came, falling she cast a fold of her dark cloak before his eyes, and he stumbled, for a fleeting drowsiness came upon him. Then Huon sprang. There befell the battle of Huon and Wolf Sauron, and the howls and baying echoed in the hills, and the watchers on the walls of Arid Wethran across the valley heard it afar and were dismayed. But no wizardry nor spell, neither fang nor venom, nor devil's art nor beast strength, could overthrow Huon of Valinor, and he took his foe by the throat and pinned him down. Then Sauron shifted shape, from wolf to serpent, and then from monster to his own accustomed form. But he would not elude the grip of Huon without forsaking his body utterly. Ere his foul spirit left its dark house, Luthien came to him, and said that he should be stripped of his raiment of flesh, and his ghost be sent quaking back to Morgoth. And she said, There everlastingly thy naked self shall endure the torment of his scorn, pierced by his eyes, unless thou yield to me the mastery of thy tower. Then Sauron yielded himself, and Luthien took the mastery of the isle, and all that was there, and Huon released him, and immediately he took the form of a vampire, great as a dark cloud across the moon, and he fled, dripping blood from his throat upon the trees, and came to Tower Nufuin, and dwelt there, filling it with horror. Now as horrid as these actions are, this is everything that we know about who Sauron was during the First Age, and what he did during this time period. We can assume that until Morgoth was defeated and sent hurtling into the void after the War of Wrath, that Sauron was ever involved in many of his machinations. But outside of that assumption, there's nothing we can really verify. So this is how Sauron came to evil, and what he wrought during his subservience to his Dark Master. But for Sauron, Scion of Evil, much of who he is and the crimes he committed upon the peoples of Middle-earth, can be chronicled in his actions following his master's banishment through the door of night. As is said in the Silmarillion, in all the deeds of Melkor, the Morgoth upon Arda, in his vast works, and in the deceits of his cunning, Sauron had a part, and was only less evil than his master, in that for long, he served another, and not himself. But in after years he rose like a shadow of Morgoth, and a ghost of his malice, and walked behind him on the same ruinous path, down into the void. When Thangaradrim was broken, and Morgoth overthrown, Sauron put on his fair hue again, and did obeisance to Aonwe, the herald of Manwe, king of the Valar, and he abjured all his evil deeds. And some hold that this was not at first falsely done, but that Sauron in truth repented, if only out of fear, being dismayed by the fall of Morgoth, and the great wrath of the lords of the west. But it was not within the power of Aonwe to pardon those of his own order, and he commanded Sauron to return to Amman, and there receive the judgment of Manwe. Then Sauron was ashamed, and he was unwilling to return in humiliation and to receive from the Valar a sentence, it might be, of long servitude and proof of his good faith. For under Morgoth, 
his power had been great. Therefore, when Aonwe departed, he hid himself in Middle-earth, and he fell back into evil, for the bonds that Morgoth had laid upon him were very strong. In the great battle in the tumults of the fall of Thangaradrim, there were mighty convulsions in the earth, and Beleriand was broken and laid waste, and northward and westward many lands sank beneath the waters of the great sea. In the east, in Osiriand, the walls of Ered Luin were broken, and a great gap was made in them towards the south. Into that gulf the river Loon fell by a new course, and it was called therefore the Gulf of Loon. That country had of old been named Linden by the Noldor, and this name it bore thereafter, and many of the Eldar still dwelt there, lingering, unwilling yet to forsake Beleriand, where they had fought and labored long. Gilgalad, son of Fingon, was their king, and with him was Elrond Half-Elven, son of Erendil the Mariner, and brother of Elros, first king of Numenor. Upon the shores of the Gulf of Loon, the elves built their havens, and named them Mithlond, and there they held many ships, for the harborage was good. From the grey havens the Eldar ever and anon set sail, fleeing from the darkness of the days of earth, for by the mercy of the Valar, the firstborn could still follow the straight road, and return, if they would, to their kindred in Erisea and Valinor beyond the encircling seas. Others of the Eldar there were who crossed the mountains of Arid Luin in that age and passed into the inner lands. Many of those were Teleri, survivors of Doriath and Osiriand, and they established realms among the sylvan elves and woods and mountains far from the sea, for which nonetheless they ever yearned in their hearts. Only in a region, which men called Holland, did elves of Noldoran race establish a lasting realm beyond the Arid Luin. A region was nigh to the great mansions of the dwarves that were named Khazad Doom, but by the elves had it rond, and afterwards, Moria. From Austin Edhil, the city of the elves, the high road ran to the west gate of Khazad Doom, for a friendship arose between dwarves and elves, such as never elsewhere been, to the enrichment of both those peoples. In a region, the craftsmen of the Gwaithi Myrdain, the people of the jewelsmiths, surpassed in cunning all that have ever wrought, save only Feanor himself. And indeed greatest in skill among them was Celebrimbor, son of Curufin, who was estranged from his father, and remained in Nargothrond when Celegorm and Curufin were driven forth, as is told in the Quenta Silmarillion. Elsewhere in Middle-earth, there was peace for many years, yet the lands were for the most part savage and desolate, save only where the people of Beleriand came. Many elves dwelt there indeed, as they had dwelt through the countless years, wandering free in the wide lands far from the sea. But they were Avari, to whom the deeds of Beleriand were but a rumor, and Valinor, only a distant name. And in the south, and in the further east, men multiplied, and most of them turned to evil, for Sauron was at work. Seeing the desolation of the world, Sauron said in his heart that the Valar, having overthrown Morgoth, had again forgotten Middle-earth, and his pride grew apace. He looked with hatred on the Eldar, and he feared the men of Numenor who came back at whiles in their ship to the shores of Middle-earth. But for long he dissembled his mind, and concealed the dark designs that he shaped in his heart. But long he sought to persuade the elves to his service, for he knew that the firstborn had the greater power, and he went far and wide among them, and his hue was still that of one both fair and wise. Only to Linden he did not come, for Gilgalad and Elrond doubted him in his fair seeming, and though they knew not who in truth he was, they would not admit him to that land. But elsewhere, the elves received him gladly, and a few among them hearkened to the messengers from Linden that bid them beware. For Sauron took to himself the name of Anatar, the Lord of Gifts, and they had at first much profit from his friendship. And he said to them, Alas, for the weakness of the great, for a mighty king is Gilgalad, and wise in all lore is Master Elrond, and yet they will not aid me in my labors. Can it be that they do not desire to see other lands become as blissful as their own? But wherefore should Middle-earth remain forever desolate and dark, whereas the elves could make it as fair as Erisea, nay, even as Valinor? And since you have not returned thither as you might, I perceive that you love this Middle-earth, as do I. Is it not then our task to labor together for its enrichment, and for the raising of all the elven kindreds that wander here untaught, to the height of that power and knowledge which those have who are beyond the sea? It was in a region that the counsels of Sauron were most gladly received, for in that land the Noldor desired ever to increase their skill and subtlety of their works. Moreover, they were not at peace in their hearts, since they had refused to return into the west, and they desired both to stay in Middle-earth, which indeed they loved, and yet to enjoy the bliss of those that had departed. Therefore they hearkened to Sauron, and they learned of him many things, for his knowledge was great. In those days the smiths of Austin Edhil surpassed all that they had contrived before, and they took thought, and they made rings of power. But Sauron guided their labors, and he was aware of all that they did, for his desire was to set a bond upon the elves, and to bring them under his vigilance. Now the elves made many rings, but secretly Sauron made one ring to rule all the others, and their power was bound up with it, to be subject wholly to it, and to last only so long as it too should last. And much of the strength and will of Sauron passed into that one ring, for the power of the elven rings was very great, and that which should govern them must be a thing of surpassing potency, and Sauron forged it in the mountain of fire, in the land of shadow. 
And while he wore the one ring, he could perceive all the things that were done by means of the lesser rings, and he could see and govern the very thoughts of those that wore them. But the elves were not so lightly to be caught. As soon as Sauron set the one ring upon his finger, they were aware of him, and they knew him, and perceived that he would be master of them, and of all that they wrought. Then in anger and fear they took off their rings. But he, finding that he was betrayed, and that the elves were not deceived, was filled with wrath and he came against them with open war, demanding that all the rings should be delivered to him, since the elven smiths could not have attained to their making without his lore and counsel. But the elves fled from him, and three of their rings they saved, and bore them away, and hid them. Now these were the three that had last been made, and they possessed the greatest powers, Naria, Nenya, and Vilia they were named, the rings of fire, and of water, and of air, set with ruby and adamant and sapphire, and of all the elven rings, Sauron most desired to possess them, for those who had them in their keeping could ward off the decays of time, and postpone the weariness of the world. But Sauron could not discover them, for they were given into the hands of the wise, who concealed them and never again used them openly, while Sauron kept the ruling ring. Therefore the three remained unsullied, for they were forged by Celebrimbor alone, and the hand of Sauron had never touched them, yet they also were subject to the one. From that time war never ceased between Sauron and the elves, and a region was laid waste, and Celebrimbor slain, and the doors of Moria were shut. In that time the stronghold and refuge of Imladris, that men called Rivendell, was founded by Elrond Half-Elven, and long it endured. But Sauron gathered into his hands all the remaining rings of power, and he dealt them out to the other peoples of Middle-earth, hoping thus to bring under his sway all those that desired secret power beyond the measure of their kind. Seven rings he gave to the dwarves, but to men he gave nine. For men proved in this matter as in others, the readiest to his will. And all those rings that he governed he perverted, the more easily since he had a part in their making, and they were accursed, and they betrayed in the end all those that used them. The dwarves indeed prove tough and hard to tame. They ill endure the domination of others, and the thoughts of their hearts are hard to fathom. They use their rings only for the getting of wealth, but wrath and an overestimating greed of gold were kindled in their hearts, of which evil enough after came to the prophet of Sauron. It is said that the foundation of each of the seven hordes of the dwarf kings of old was a golden ring, but all those hordes long ago were plundered and the dragons devoured them, and of the seven rings, some were consumed in fire, and some Sauron recovered. Men proved easier to ensnare. Those who used the nine rings became mighty in their day, kings, sorcerers, and warriors of old. They obtained glory and great wealth, yet it turned to their undoing. They had, as it seemed, unending life, yet life became unendurable to them. They could walk, if they would, unseen by all eyes in the world beneath the sun, and they could see things in worlds invisible to mortal men, but too often they beheld only the phantoms and delusions of Sauron. And one by one, sooner or later, according to their native strength and to the good or evil of their wills in the beginning, they fell under the thraldom of the ring that they bore, and under the domination of the one, which was Sauron's. And they became forever invisible save to him that wore the ruling ring, and they entered into the realm of shadows. The Nazgul were they, the Ringwraiths, the enemy's most terrible servants. Darkness went with them, and they cried with the voices of death. Now Sauron's lust and pride increased, until he knew no bounds. And he determined to make himself master of all things in Middle-earth, and to destroy the elves, and to compass, if he might, the downfall of Numenor. He brooked no freedom nor any rivalry, and he named himself Lord of the Earth. A mask he still could wear so that if he wished he might deceive the eyes of men, seeming to them wise and fair. But he ruled rather by force and fear, if they might avail. And those who perceived his shadow spreading over the world called him the Dark Lord, and named him the Enemy. And he gathered again under his government all the evil things of the days of Morgoth that remained on earth or beneath it. And the orcs were at his command and multiplied like flies. Thus the Black Years began, which the elves call the Days of Flight. In that time many of the elves of Middle-earth fled to Linden, and thence over the seas never to return, and many were destroyed by Sauron and his servants. But in Linden, Gilgalad still maintained his power, and Sauron dared not as yet to pass the mountains of Ered Luin, nor to assail the havens, and Gilgalad was aided by the Numenorians. Elsewhere Sauron reigned, and those who would be free took refuge in the fastness of wood and mountain, and ever fear pursued them. In the east and south well nigh all men were under his dominion, and they grew strong in those days and built many towns and walls of stone, and they were numerous and fierce in war, and armed with iron. To them, Sauron was both king and god, and they feared him exceedingly, for he surrounded his abode with fire. Yet there came at length a stay in the onslaught of Sauron upon the Westlands, for as is told in the Akalabeth, he was challenged by the might of Numenor. So great was the power and splendor of the Numenorians in the noontide of their realm, that the servants of Sauron would not withstand them, and hoping to accomplish by cunning what he could not achieve by force, he left Middle-earth for a while and went to Numenor as a hostage of Tarkalian the king. And there he abode, until at the last by his craft, he had corrupted most of the hearts of that people, and set them at war with the Valar, and so compassed their ruin, as he had long desired. 
But that ruin was more terrible than Sauron had foreseen, for he had forgotten the might of the lords of the west in their anger. The world was broken, and the land was swallowed up, and the seas rose over it, and Sauron himself went down into the abyss. But his spirit arose and fled back on a dark wind to Middle-earth, seeking a home. There he found that the power of Gilgalad had grown great in the years of his absence, and it was spread now over wide regions of the north and west, and had passed beyond the misty mountains, and the great river even to the borders of Greenwood the Great, and was drawing nigh to the strong places where once he had dwelt secure. Then Sauron withdrew to his fortress in the Black Land, and meditated war. In that time those of the Numenorians who were saved from destruction fled eastward, as is told in the Akalabeth. The chief of these were Elendil the Tall and his sons, Isildur and Anarion. Kinsmen of the king they were, descendants of Elros, but they had been unwilling to listen to Sauron, and had refused to make war on the lords of the west. Manning their ships with all who remained faithful, they forsook the land of Numenor, ere ruin came upon it. They were mighty men and their ships were strong and tall, but the tempests overtook them, and they were borne aloft on hills of water even to the clouds, and they descended upon Middle-earth like birds of the storm. Elendil was cast up by the waves in the land of Linden, and he was befriended by Gilgalad. Thence he passed up the river Lune, and beyond Arid Luin he established his realm, and his people dwelt in many places in Eriador about the courses of the Lune and the Baranduin, but his chief city was at Anuminas, beside the water of Lake Nanuial. At Fornost upon the North Downs also the Numenorians dwelt, and in Cardalon, and in the hills of Rudaur, and towers they raised upon Emin Bered, and upon Amon Sul, and there remain many barrows and ruined works in those places. But the towers of Emin Bered still look towards the sea. Isildur and Anarion were borne away southwards, and at the last they brought their ships up the great river Anduin, that flows out of Rovanion into the western sea in the Bay of Belphalas, and they established a realm in those lands that were after called Gondor, whereas the northern kingdom was named Arnor. Long before, in the days of their power, the mariners of Numenor had established a haven in strong places about the mouths of Anduin, in despite of Sauron and the black land that lay nigh upon the east. In the later days to this haven came only the faithful of Numenor, and many therefore of the folk of the coastlands in that region were in whole or in part akin to the elf friends and the people of Elendil, and they welcomed his sons. The chief city of this southern realm was Osgiliath, through the midst of which the great river flowed, and the Numenorians built there a great bridge, upon which there were towers and houses of stone wonderful to behold, and tall ships came up out of the sea to the quays of the city. Other strong places they built also upon either hand, Minas Ithil, the Tower of the Rising Moon, eastward upon a shoulder of the Mountains of Shadow as a threat to Mordor, and to the westward, Minas Anor, the Tower of the Setting Sun, at the feet of Mount Mindoluin, as a shield against the wild men of the Dales. In Minas Ithil was the house of Isildur, and in Minas Anor, the house of Anarion. But they shared the realm between them, and their thrones were set side by side in the Great Hall of Osgiliath. These were the chief dwellings of the Numenorians in Gondor, but other works marvelous and strong they built in the land in the days of their power, at the Argonath, and at Aglarond, and at Eric, and in the circle of Angranost, which men called Isengard, they made the pinnacle of Orthanc of unbreakable stone. Many treasures and great heirlooms of virtue and wonder the exiles had brought from Numenor, and of those the most renowned were the seven stones, and the white tree. The white tree was grown from the fruit of Nimloth the fair, that stood in the courts of the king at Armenelos in Numenor, ere Sauron burned it, and Nimloth was in its turn descended from the tree of Tyrion, that was an image of the eldest of trees, white to Leprion, which Yavanna caused to grow in the land of the Valar. The tree, memorial of the Eldar and of the light of Valinor, was planted in Minas Ithil, before the house of Isildur, since he it was that had saved the fruit from destruction, but the stones were divided. Three Elendil took, and his sons each two. Those of Elendil were set in towers upon Amon Barad, and upon Amon Sul, and in the city of Anuminas. But those of his sons were at Minas Ithil, and Minas Anor, and at Orthanc, and in Osgiliath. Now these stones had this virtue that those who looked therein might perceive in them things far off, whether in place, or in time. For the most part they revealed only things near to another kindred stone, for the stones each called to each, but those who possessed great strength of will and of mind might learn to direct their gaze whither they would. Thus the Numenorians were aware of many things that their enemies wished to conceal, and little escaped their vigilance in the days of their might. It is said that the towers of Amon Barad were not built indeed by the exiles of Numenor, but were raised by Gilgalad for Elendil, his friend, and the seeing stone of Amon Barad was set in Elastirion, the tallest of the towers. Thither Elendil would repair, and thence he would gaze out over the sundering seas when the yearning of exile was upon him, and it is believed that thus he would at while see far away upon the tower of Avalone upon Eresia, where the master stone abode, and yet abides. These stones were gifts of the Eldar to Amandil, father of Elendil, for the comfort of the faithful of Numenor in their dark days, when the elves might come no longer to that land under the shadow of Sauron. They were called the Palantiri, those that watch from afar, but all those that were brought to Middle-earth long ago were lost. Thus the exiles of Numenor established their realms in Arnor and in Gondor, but ere many years had passed, it became manifest that their enemy, Sauron, had also returned. He came in secret, as has been told, to his ancient kingdom of Mordor beyond the Efelduath, the Mountains of Shadow, 
and that country marched with Gondor upon the east. There above the valley of Gorgoroth was built his fortress vast and strong, Barad-dûr, the Dark Tower, and there was a fiery mountain in that land that the elves named Ored Ruin. Indeed for that reason Sauron had set there his dwelling long before, for he used the fire that welled there from the heart of the earth in his sorceries, and in his forging, and in the midst of the land of Mordor, he had fashioned the ruling ring. There now he brooded in the dark, until he had wrought for himself a new shape, and it was terrible, for his fair semblance had departed forever when he was cast into the abyss at the drowning of Numenor. He took up again the great ring and clothed himself in power, and the malice of the eye of Sauron few even of the great among elves and men could endure. Now Sauron prepared war against the Eldar, and the men of Westerness, and the fires of the mountain were wakened again. Wherefore, seeing the smoke of Ored ruin from afar, and perceiving that Sauron had returned, the Numenorians named that mountain anew Ammon Armarth, which is Mount Doom. And Sauron gathered to him great strength of his servants out of the east and the south, and among them were not a few of the high race of Numenor. For in the days of the sojourn of Sauron in that land, the hearts of well-nigh all its people had been turned towards darkness. Therefore many of those who sailed east in that time and made fortresses and dwellings upon the coast were already bent to his will, and they served him still gladly in Middle-earth. But because of the power of Gilgalad, these renegades, lords both mighty and evil, for the most part took up their abodes in the southlands far away. Yet too there were, Herumor and Fuinur, who rose to power among the Haradrim, a great and cruel people that dwelt in the wide land south of Mordor, beyond the mouths of Anduin. When therefore Sauron saw his time, he came with great force against the new realm of Gondor, and he took Minas Ithil, and he destroyed the white tree of Isildur that grew there. But Isildur escaped, and taking with him a seedling of the tree, he went with his wife and sons by ship down the river, and they sailed from the mouths of Anduin seeking Elendil. Meanwhile Anarion held Osgiliath against the enemy, and for that time drove him back to the mountains. But Sauron gathered his strength again, and Anarion knew that unless help should come, his kingdom would not long stand. Now Elendil and Gilgalad took counsel together, for they perceived that Sauron would grow too strong, and would overcome all his enemies one by one, if they did not unite against him. Therefore they made that league which is called the Last Alliance, and they marched east into Middle-earth, gathering a great host of elves and men, and they halted for a while at Imladris. It is said that the host that was there assembled was fairer and more splendid in arms than any that has been since seen in Middle-earth, and none greater has been mustered since the host of the Valar went against Thangaradrim. From Inladris they crossed the Misty Mountains by many passes, and marched down the river Anduin, and so came at last upon the host of Sauron on Daggerlad, the battle plain, which lies before the gate of the Black Land. All living things were divided in that day, and some of every kind, even of beasts and birds, were found in either host, save the elves only. They alone were undivided, and followed Gilgalad. Of the dwarves few fought upon either side, but the kindred of Durin fought against Sauron. The host of Gilgalad and Elendil had the victory, for the might of the elves was still great in those days, and the Numenorians were strong and tall, and terrible in their wrath. Against Aglos, the spear of Gilgalad, none could stand, and the sword of Elendil filled orcs and men with fear, for it shone with the light of the sun, and of the moon, and it was named Narsil. Then Gilgalad and Elendil passed into Mordor, and encompassed the stronghold of Sauron, and they laid siege to it for seven years, and suffered grievous loss by fire, and by the darts and bolts of the enemy, and Sauron sent many sorties against them. There in the valley of Gorgoroth, Anarion son of Elendil was slain, and many others. But at the last the siege was so straight, that Sauron himself came forth, and he wrestled with Gilgalad and Elendil, and they both were slain, and the sword of Elendil broke under him as he fell. But Sauron also was thrown down, and with the hilt shard of Narsil, Isildur cut the ruling ring from the hand of Sauron, and took it for his own. Then Sauron was for that time vanquished, and he forsook his body, and his spirit fled far away, and hid in waste places, and he took no visible shape again for many long years. Thus began the third age of the world, after the eldest days, and the black years, and there was still hope in that time, and the memory of mirth, and for long the white tree of the Eldar flowered in the courts of the kings of men, for the seedling which he had saved, Isildur planted in the citadel of Anor, in memory of his brother Anarion, ere he departed from Gondor. The servants of Sauron were routed and dispersed, yet they were not wholly destroyed. And though many men turned now from evil and became subject to the heirs of Elendil, yet many more remembered Sauron in their hearts, and hated the kingdoms of the West. The dark tower was leveled to the ground, yet its foundations remained, and it was not forgotten. The Numenorians indeed set a guard upon the land of Mordor, but none dared dwell there because of the terror of the memory of Sauron, and because of the mountain of fire that stood nigh to Barad-dûr, and the valley of Gorgoroth was filled with ash. Many of the elves and many of the Numenorians and of men who were their allies had perished in the battle and the siege, and Elendil the Tall and Gilgalad the High King were no more. Never again was such a host assembled, nor was there any such league of elves and men, for after Elendil's day, the two kindreds became estranged. The ruling ring passed out of the knowledge even of the wise in that age, yet it was not unmade, for Isildur would not surrender it to Elrond and Círdan who stood by. 
they counseled him to cast it into the fire of Orod Ruin nigh at hand, in which it had been forged, so that it should perish, and the power of Sauron be forever diminished, and he should remain only as a shadow of malice in the wilderness. But Isildur refused this counsel, saying, This I will have as a were-guild, for my father's death, and my brother's. Was it not I that dealt the enemy his death blow? And the ring that he held seemed to him exceedingly fair to look on, and he would not suffer it to be destroyed. Taking it therefore he returned at first to Minas Anor, and there planted the white tree in memory of his brother Anarion. But soon he departed, and after he had given counsel to Meneldil, his brother's son, and had committed to him the realm of the south, he bore away the ring to be an heirloom of his house, and marched north from Gondor by the way that Elendil had come, and he forsook the south kingdom, for he purposed to take up his father's realm in Eriador, far from the shadow of the black land. But Isildur was overwhelmed by a host of orcs that lay in wait in the misty mountains, and they descended upon him at unawares in his camp between the greenwood and the great river nigh to the gladdened fields, for he was heedless and set no guard, deeming that all his foes were overthrown. There well nigh all his people were slain, and among them were his three elder sons, Elendur, Aratan, and Kirion. But his wife and his youngest son, Valendil, he had left in him Ladris when he went to the war. Isildur himself escaped by means of the ring, for when he wore it he was invisible to all eyes, but the orcs hunted him by scent and slot, until he came to the river and plunged in. There the ring betrayed him, and avenged its maker, for it slipped from his finger as he swam, and it was lost in the water. Then the orcs saw him as he labored in the stream, and they shot him with many arrows, and that was his end. Only three of his people came ever back over the mountains after long wandering, and of these one was Otar, his esquire, to whose keeping he had given the shards of the sword of Elendil. Thus Narsil came in due time to the hand of Valendil, Isildur's heir, in Imladris. But the blade was broken, and its light was extinguished, and it was not forged anew. And Master Elrond foretold that this would not be done until the ruling ring should be found again and Sauron should return. But the hope of elves and men was that these things might never come to pass. Valendil took up his abode in Anuminas, but his folk were diminished, and of the Numenorians and of the men of Eriador, there remained now too few to people the land, or to maintain all the places that Elendil had built. In Daggerlad, and in Mordor, and upon the gladdened fields, many had fallen. And it came to pass after the days of Erendur, the seventh king that followed Valendil, that the men of Westernus, the Dúnedain of the north, became divided into petty realms and lordships, and their foes devoured them one by one. Ever they dwindled with the years, until their glory passed, leaving only green mounds in the grass. At length naught was left of them but a strange people wandering secretly in the wild, and other men knew not their homes nor their purpose of their journeys, and save in Imladris, in the house of Elrond, their ancestry was forgotten. Yet the shards of the sword were cherished during many lives of men by the heirs of Isildur, and their line, from father to son, remained unbroken. In the south, the realm of Gondor endured, and for a time its splendor grew, until it recalled the wealth and majesty of Numenor, ere it fell. High towers the people of Gondor built, and strong places and havens of many ships, and the winged crown of the kings of men was held in awe by people of many lands and tongues. For many a year the white tree grew before the king's house in Minas Anor, the seed of that tree which Isildur brought out of the depths of the sea from Numenor, and the seed before that came from Avalone, from Valinor in the day before days, when the world was young. Yet at the last, in the wearing of the swift years of Middle-earth, Gondor waned, and the line of Meneldil son of Anarion failed. For the blood of the Numenorians became much mingled with that of other men, and their power and wisdom was diminished, and their lifespan was shortened, and the watch upon Mordor slumbered. And in the days of Telemnar, a plague came upon dark winds out of the east, and it smote the king and his children, and many of the people of Gondor perished. Then the forts on the borders of Mordor were deserted, and Minas Ithil was emptied of its people, and evil entered again into the black land secretly, and the ashes of Gorgoroth were stirred as by a cold wind, for dark shapes gathered there. It is said that these were indeed the Uleri, whom Sauron called the Nazgul, the nine ring race that had long remained hidden, but returned now to prepare the ways of their master, for he had begun to grow again. And in the days of Aranil, they made their first stroke, and they came by night out of Mordor over the passes of the Mountains of Shadow, and took Minas Ithil for their abode, and they made it a place of such dread, that none dared to look upon it. Thereafter it was called Minas Morgul, the Tower of Sorcery, and Minas Morgul was ever at war with Minas Anor in the west. Then Osgiliath, which in the waning of the people had long been deserted, became a place of ruins, and a city of ghosts. But Minas Anor endured, and it was named anew Minas Tirith, the Tower of Guard, for there the kings caused to be built in the citadel a white tower, very tall and fair, and its eye was upon many lands. Proud still and strong was that city, and in it the white trees still flowered for a while before the house of the kings, and there the remnant of the Numenorians still defended the passage of the river against the terrors of Minas Morgul, and against all the enemies of the west, orcs and monsters, and evil men, and thus the lands behind them, west of Anduin, were protected from war and destruction. Still Minas Turth endured after the A's of Aranur, son of Aranil, and the last king of Gondor.
He it was that rode alone to the gates of Minas Morgul to meet the challenge of the Morgul Lord, and he met him in single combat. But he was betrayed by the Nazgul and taken alive into the city of Torment, and no living man saw him ever again. Now Aernur left no heir, but when the line of the kings failed, the stewards of the house of Mardiel the Faithful ruled the city and its ever-shrinking realm, and the Rohirrim, the horsemen of the north, came and dwelt in the green land of Rohan, which before was named Kalinarton, and was a part of the kingdom of Gondor, and the Rohirrim aided the lords of the city in their wars. And northward, beyond the falls of Rauros, and the gates of Arganath, there were as yet other defenses, powers more ancient of which men knew little, against whom the things of evil did not dare to move, until in the ripening of time their dark lord, Sauron, should come forth again. And until that time was come, never again after the days of Aernil, did the Nazgul dare to cross the river, or to come forth from their city in shape visible to men. Now for the last few minutes, you'll notice that we've been discussing how the realms of men were divided up after Sauron's first defeat. And while this information might seem fairly useless as far as Sauron's character is concerned, I promise you that there's a point to absorbing this information. Knowing these things is actually quite important to the evil surrounding Sauron's character, which we'll get to in a moment after we've gone through a bit more information. In Eriador, Imladris was the chief dwelling of the High Elves, but at the Grey Havens of Linden, there abode also a remnant of the people of Gilgalad, the Elven King. At times they would wander into the lands of Eriador, but for the most part they dwelt near the shores of the sea, building and tending the elven ships wherein those of the firstborn who grew weary of the world set sail into the uttermost west. Círdan the shipwright was lord of the havens, and mighty among the wise. Of the three rings that the elves had preserved unsullied, no open word was ever spoken among the wise, and few even of the Eldar knew where they were bestowed. Yet after the fall of Sauron their power was ever at work, and where they abode their mirth also dwelt, and all things were unstained by the griefs of time. Therefore, ere the Third Age was ended, the elves perceived that the Ring of Sapphire was with Elrond, in the fair valley of Rivendell, upon whose house the stars of heaven most brightly shone, whereas the Ring of Adamant was in the land of Lorien, where dwelt the Lady Galadriel. A queen she was of the woodland elves, the wife of Celeborn of Doriath, yet she herself was of the Noldor, and remembered the day before days in Valinor, and she was the mightiest and fairest of all the elves that remained in Middle-earth. But the Red Ring remained hidden until the end, and none save Elrond and Galadriel and Círdan knew to whom it had been committed. Thus it was that in two domains the bliss and beauty of the elves remained still undiminished while that age endured, in Imladris and in Lothorian, the hidden land between Celebrant and Anduin, where the trees bore flowers of gold, and no orc or evil thing dared ever come. Yet many voices were heard among the elves foreboding that, if Sauron should come again, then either he would find the ruling ring that was lost, or at the best, his enemies would discover it and destroy it. But in either chance the powers of the three must then fail, and all things maintained by them must fade, and so the elves should pass into the twilight, and the dominion of men begin. And so indeed it is since befallen, the one and the seven and the nine are destroyed, and the three have passed away, and with them the third age is ended, and the tales of the Eldar and Middle-earth draw to their close. Those were the fading years, and in them the last flowering of the elves east of the sea came to its winter. In that time the Noldor walked still in the hitherlands, mightiest and fairest of the children of the world, and their tongues were still heard by mortal ears. Many things of beauty and wonder remained on earth in that time, and many things also of evil and dread. Orcs there were, and trolls and dragons and fell beasts, and strange creatures old and wise in the woods whose names are forgotten. Dwarves still labored in the hills, and wrought with patient craftworks of metal and stone that none now can rival. But the dominion of men was preparing, and all things were changing, until at last the Dark Lord arose in Mirkwood again. Now of old the name of that forest was Greenwood the Great, and its wide halls and aisles were the haunt of many beasts and of birds of bright song, and there was the realm of King Thranduil, under the oak and the beech. But after many years, when well nigh a third of that age of the world had passed, a darkness crept slowly through the wood from the southward, and fear walked there in shadowy glades. Fell beasts came hunting, and cruel and evil creatures laid their snares. Then the name of the forest was changed, and Mirkwood it was called, for the nightshade lay deep there, and few dared to pass through, save only in the north where Thranduil's people still held the evil at bay. Whence it came few could tell, and it was long ere even the wise could discover it. It was the shadow of Sauron, and the sign of his return. For coming out of the waste of the east, he took up his abode in the south of the forest, and slowly he grew and took shape there again. In a dark hill he made his dwelling and wrought there his sorcery, and all folk feared the sorcerer of Dol Guldur, and yet they knew not at first how great was their peril. Even as the first shadows were felt in Mirkwood, there appeared in the west of Middle-earth the Astari, whom men called the Wizards. 
None knew at that time whence they were, save Círdan of the Havens, and only to Elrond and to Galadriel did he reveal that they came over the sea. But afterwards it was said among the elves that they were messengers sent by the lords of the west to contest the power of Sauron, if he should arise again, and to move elves and men and all living things of goodwill to valiant deeds. In the likeness of men they appeared, old but vigorous, and they changed little with the years, and aged but slowly, though great cares lay on them, great wisdom they had, and many powers of mind and hand. Long they journeyed far and wide among elves and men, and held converse also with beasts and with birds. And the peoples of Middle-earth gave to them many names, for their true names they did not reveal. Chief among them were those whom the elves called Mithrandir and Kurunir, but men in the north named Gandalf and Saruman. Of these, Kurunir was the eldest and came first, and after him came Mithrandir and Radagast, and others of the Istari who went into the east of Middle-earth, and do not come into these tales. Radagast was the friend of all beasts and birds, but Kurunir went most among men, and he was subtle in speech and skilled in all the devices of smithcraft. Mithrandir was closest in council with Elrond and the elves. He wandered far in the north and west and made never in any land any lasting abode. But Kurunir journeyed into the east, and when he returned, he dwelt at Orthanc in the ring of Isengard, which the Numenorians made in the days of their power. Ever most vigilant was Mithrandir, and he it was that most doubted the darkness in Mirkwood. For though many deemed that it was wrought by the Ringwraiths, he feared that it was indeed the first shadow of Sauron returning. And he went to his tower in Mirkwood, and the sorcerer fled from him, and there was a watchful peace for a long while. But at length, the shadow returned, and its power increased, and in that time was first made the Council of the Wise that is called the White Council, and therein were Elrond and Galadriel and Círdan, and other lords of the Eldar, and with them were Mithrandir and Kurunir, and Kurunir, that was Sarum in the White, was chosen to be their chief, for he had most studied the devices of Sauron of old. Galadriel indeed had wished that Mithrandir should be the head of the council, and Saruman begrudged them that, for his pride and desire of mastery was grown great. But Mithrandir refused the office, since he would have no ties and no allegiance, save to those who sent him, and he would abide in no place, nor be subject to any summons. But Saruman now began to study the lore of the rings of power, their making, and their history. Now the shadow grew ever greater, and the hearts of Elrond and Mithrandir darkened. Therefore on a time Mithrandir at great peril went again to the tower in Mirkwood, and the pits of the sorcerer, and he discovered the truth of his fears, and escaped. And returning to Elrond he said, True, alas, is our guess. This is not of the Uleri, as many have long supposed. It is Sauron himself who has taken shape again, and now grows apace. And he is gathering again all the rings to his hand, and he seeks ever for news of the One, and of the heirs of Isildur, if they live still on earth. And Elrond answered, In the hour that Isildur took the ring and would not surrender it, this doom was wrought, that Sauron should return. Yet the one was lost, said Mithrandir, and while it still lies hid, we can master the enemy, if we gather our strength and tarry not too long. Then the White Council was summoned, and Mithrandir urged them to swift deeds. But Kurunir spoke against him, and counseled them to wait yet, and to watch. For I believe not, said he, that the one will ever be found again in Middle-earth. Into Anduin it fell, and long ago, I deem, it was rolled to the sea. There it shall lie until the end, when all the world is broken, and the deeps are removed. Therefore naught was done at that time, though Elrond's heart misgave him, and he said to Mithrandir, Nonetheless I forebode that the one will yet be found, and then war will arise again, and in that war this age will be ended. Indeed in a second darkness it will end, unless some strange chance delivers us that my eyes cannot see. Many are the strange chances of the world, said Mithrandir, and help off shall come from the hands of the weak, when the wise falter. Thus the wise were troubled, but none as yet perceived that Kurinir had turned to dark thoughts, and was already a traitor in heart, for he desired that he and no other should find the great ring, so that he might wield it himself and order all the world to his will. Too long he had studied the ways of Sauron and hoped to defeat him, and now he envied him as a rival, rather than hated his works. And he deemed that the ring, which was Sauron's, would seek for its master as he became manifest once more, but if he were driven out again, then it would lie hid. Therefore he was willing to play with peril, and let Sauron be for a time, hoping by his craft to forestall both his friends, and the enemy, when the ring should appear. He set a watch upon the gladden fields, but soon he discovered that the servants of the tower in Mirkwood were searching all the ways of the river in that region. Then he perceived that Sauron also had learned of the manner of Isildur's end, and he grew afraid, and withdrew to Isengard and fortified it, and ever he probed deeper into the lore of the rings of power, and the art of their forging. But he spoke of none of this to the council, hoping still that he might be the first to hear news of the ring. He gathered a great host of spies, and many of these were birds, for Radagast lent him his aid, divining naught of his treachery, and deeming that this was but part of the watch upon the enemy. But ever the shadow in Mirkwood grew deeper, and to that dark tower among its trees, evil things repaired out of all the dark places of the world, and they were united again under one will. 
and their malice was directed against the elves and the survivors of Numenor. Therefore at last the council was again summoned, and the lore of the rings was much debated. But Mithrandir spoke to the council, saying, It is not needed that the ring should be found, for while it abides on earth, and is not unmade, still the power that it holds will live, and Sauron will grow, and have hope. The might of the elves and the elf friends is less now than of old. Soon he will be too strong for you, even without the great ring. For he rules the nine, and of the seven, he has recovered three. We must strike. To this Kurinir now assented, desiring that Sauron should be thrust from his tower in Mirkwood, which was nigh to the river, and should have leisure to search there no longer. Therefore, for the last time, he aided the council, and they put forth their strength, and they assailed his tower, and drove Sauron from his hold. And Mirkwood for a brief while was made wholesome again. But their stroke was too late, for the Dark Lord had foreseen it, and he had long prepared all his movements, and the Uleri, his nine servants, had gone before him to make ready for his coming. Therefore his flight was but a feint, and he soon returned, and ere the wise could prevent him, he re-entered his kingdom in Mordor, and reared once again the dark towers of Barad-dûr. Now in all that I just read to you, we were given much more insight into the events of Sauron's story that you may recall being mentioned in both The Hobbit and The Lord of the Rings books and films, but there's something in particular that I'd like to highlight here. Sauron's Corruption After his master's downfall, Sauron in the beginning of his tenure as Dark Lord endeavored to deceive and manipulate the people of Middle-earth, much like Morgoth did during his time in Valinor. And before he declared open war against the peoples of this world, much of the evil he committed came as a result of the nefarious tendrils that he had weaved about nearly every corner of the world. It's because of his pervasive and corrupting influence that by the time the story of The Hobbit begins, the many peoples of this world have become a shadow of what they once were. The realms of men are fractured, the dominion of the elves has diminished significantly, and the animosity between dwarves and the other peoples of this world were never higher, and the decay and misery that was present after his downfall were all derived from his lasting influence, and it was because Sauron's machinations were so cunning that even after he was reduced to a phantom, the world's decline could not be stopped, and it was this decline set in motion by his own actions that ultimately paved the way for him to return once again, only this time, with the nations of old reduced to a fraction of what they once were, and the heroes of past ages now lost to time. Sauron's planned dominion over the entire world was now almost an assurance if only he could find the One Ring. Haldir describes this aspect of Sauron's character well in The Lord of the Rings. Indeed in nothing is the power of the Dark Lord more clearly shown than in the estrangement that divides all those who still oppose him. Yet so little faith and trust do we find now in the world beyond Lothorian, unless maybe in Rivendell, that we dare not by our own trust endanger our land. We live now upon an island amid many perils, and our hands are more often upon the bowstring than upon the harp. This speaks to Sauron's talents in manipulation, subterfuge, and long-term planning, and though he contains the arrogance and hubris of any Dark Lord within his character, the intelligence of Sauron, and the mastery with which he was able to infiltrate his enemies, and so discord amongst them via his rings and other devices, is a large part of what made him so terrifying, for he is very wise, and weighs all things to a nicety in the scales of his malice. But there is more to tell about Sauron's talents in this regard, and aside from his creation of the rings, and his use of them to corrupt the many peoples of this world, there is another crime that he committed that serves as one of the most horrifying things he ever accomplished, his orchestration of the downfall of Numenor. In the excerpts from the Silmarillion I just read to you, we were given mention of this downfall, and the tale associated with it, the Akalabeth. But just like with everything else surrounding Sauron's character, a mere mention of his deeds is not enough to convey to you the horror of this dread creature. And so now, to understand further just how terrifyingly cunning Sauron is, I will read for you the Akalabeth, or the downfall, of Numenor. It is said by the Eldar that men came into the world in the time of the shadow of Morgoth, and they fell swiftly under his dominion, for he sent his emissaries among them, and they listened to his evil and cunning words, and they worshipped the darkness, and yet feared it. But there were some that turned from evil, and left the lands of their kindred, and wandered ever westward, for they had heard a rumor that in the west there was a light which the shadow could not dim. The servants of Morgoth pursued them with hatred, and their ways were long and hard, yet they came at last to the lands that look upon the sea, and they entered Beleriand in the days of the War of the Jewels. The Adain these were named in the Sindarin tongue, and they became friends and allies of the Eldar, and did deeds of great valor in the war against Morgoth. Of them was sprung, upon the side of his fathers, Bright Erendil, and in the Lay of Erendil, it is told how at the last, when the victory of Morgoth was almost complete, he built his ship Vingilot, that men called Rothenzil, and voyaged upon the unsailed seas, seeking ever for Valinor, for he desired to speak before the powers on behalf of the two kindreds, that the valor might have pity on them, and send them help in their uttermost need. Therefore by elves and men he is called Erendil the Blessed for he achieved his quest after long labors and many perils, and from Valinor there came the host of the lords of the west. But Erendil came never back to the lands that he had loved, 
in the great battle when at last Morgoth was overthrown and Thangorodrum was broken, the Edain alone of the kindreds of men fought for the Valar, whereas many others fought for Morgoth. And after the victory of the Lords of the West, those of the evil men who were not destroyed fled back into the East, where many of their race were still wandering in the unharvested lands, wild and lawless, refusing alike the summons of the Valar and of Morgoth. And the evil men came among them, and cast over them a shadow of fear, and they took them for kings. Then the Valar forsook for a time the men of Middle-earth, who had refused their summons, and had taken the friends of Morgoth to be their masters. And men dwelt in darkness, and were troubled by many evil things that Morgoth had devised in the days of his dominion, demons, and dragons, and misshapen beasts, and the unclean orcs, that are mockeries of the children of Ilovatar. And the lot of men was unhappy. But Manwe put forth Morgoth, and shut him beyond the world in the void that is without, and he cannot himself return again into the world, present and visible, while the lords of the west are still enthroned. Yet the seeds that he had planted still grew and sprouted, bearing evil fruit, if any would tend them. For his will remained, and guided his servants, moving them ever to thwart the will of the Valar, and to destroy those that obeyed them. This the lords of the west knew full well. When therefore Morgoth had been thrust forth, they held counsel concerning the ages that should come after. The Eldar they summoned to return into the west, and those that hearkened to the summons dwelt in the Isle of Erisea. And there is in that land a haven that is named Avalone, for it is of all cities the nearest to Valinor, and the Tower of Avalone is the first sight that the mariner beholds when at last he draws nigh to the undying lands over the leagues of the sea. To the fathers of men of the three faithful houses, rich reward also was given. Aeonwe came among them and taught them, and they were given wisdom and power and life more enduring than any others of mortal race have possessed. A land was made for the Edain to dwell in, neither part of Middle-earth, nor of Valinor, for it was sundered from either by a wide sea, yet it was nearer to Valinor. It was raised by Osa out of the depths of the great water, and it was established by Aule, and enriched by Yavanna. And the Eldar brought thither flowers and fountains out of Tolerisea, that land the Valar called Andor, the land of gift. And the star of Arendil shone bright in the west as a token that all was made ready, and as a guide over the sea, and men marveled to see that silver flame in the pass of the sun. Then the Edain set sail upon the deep waters, following the star, and the Valar laid a peace upon the sea for many days, and sent sunlight and a sailing wind, so that the waters glittered before the eyes of the Edain like rippling glass, and the foam flew like snow before the stems of their ships. But so bright was Rothensil that even at morning, men could see it glimmering in the west, and in the cloudless night it shone alone, for no other star could stand beside it. And setting their course towards it, the Edain came at last over leagues of sea, and saw afar the land that was prepared for them, the land of gift, shimmering in a golden haze. Then they went up out of the sea and found a country fair and fruitful, and they were glad. And they called that land Elena, which is starwards, but also Anadune, which is westerness, Numenor, in the high Eldaran tongue. This was the beginning of that people that in the grey elven speech are called the Dunedain, the Numenorians, kings among men. But they did not thus escape from the doom of death that Iluvatar had set upon all mankind, and they were mortal still, though their years were long, and they knew no sickness, ere the shadow fell upon them. Therefore they grew wise and glorious, and in all things more like to the firstborn than any other of the kindreds of men. And they were tall, taller than the tallest of the sons of Middle-earth, and the light of their eyes was like the bright stars. But their numbers increased only slowly in the land, for though daughters and sons were born to them, fairer than their fathers, yet their children were few. Of old the chief city and haven of Numenor was in the midst of its western coasts, and it was called Andunie because it faced the sunset. But in the midst of the land was a mountain tall and steep, and it was named the Menotarma, the pillar of heaven. And upon it was a high place that was hallowed to Eruilavatar, and it was open and unroofed, and no other temple or fane was there in the land of the Numenorians. At the feet of the mountain were built the tombs of the kings, and hard by upon a hill was Armenelos, fairest of cities, and there stood the tower and the citadel that was raised by Elros, son of Arendil, whom the Valar appointed to be the first king of the Dunedain. Now Elros and Elrond his brother were descended from the three houses of the Edain, but in part also both from the Eldar and the Maiar, for Idril of Gondolin and Luthien daughter of Melian were their foremothers. The Valar indeed may not withdraw the gift of death, which comes to men from Iluvatar, but in the matter of the half-elven, Iluvatar gave to them that judgment, and they judged that to the sons of Arendil should be given choice of their own destiny. And Elrond chose to remain with the firstborn, and to him the life of the firstborn was granted. But to Elros, who chose to be a king of men, still a great span of years was allotted, many times that of the men of Middle-earth. And all his line, the kings and lords of the royal house, had long life even according to the measure of the Numenorians. But Elros lived five hundred years, and ruled the Numenorians four hundred years and ten. Thus the years passed, and while Middle-earth went backward, and light and wisdom faded, the Dunedain dwelt under the protection of the Valar, and in the friendship of the Eldar, and they increased in stature both of mind and body. 
For though the people used still their own speech, their kings and lords knew and spoke also the elven tongue, which they had learned in the days of their alliance. And thus they held converse still with the Eldar, whether of Arisea or of the Westlands of Middle-earth. And the lore masters among them learned also the high Eldarin tongue of the blessed realm, in which much story and song was preserved from the beginning of the world. And they made letters and scrolls and books, and wrote in them many things of wisdom and wonder in the high tide of their realm, of which all is now forgot. So it came to pass that, beside their own names, all the lords of the Numenorians had also Eldarin names, and the like with the cities and fair places that they founded in Numenor, and on the shores of the hitherlands. For the Dunedain became mighty in crafts, so that if they had had the mind, they could easily have surpassed the evil kings of Middle-earth, in the making of war, and the forging of weapons. But they were become men of peace. Above all arts they nourished shipbuilding and sea craft, and they became mariners whose like shall never be again since the world was diminished. And voyaging upon the wide seas was the chief feat and adventure of their hardy men in the gallant days of their youth. But the lords of Valinor forbade them to sail so far westward that the coast of Numenor could no longer be seen, and for long the Dunedain were content, though they did not fully understand the purpose of this ban. But the design of Manwe was that the Numenorians should not be tempted to seek for the blessed realm, nor desire to overpass the limits set to their bliss, becoming enamored of the immortality of the Valar, and the Eldar, and the lands where all things endure. For in those days, Valinor still remained in the world visible, and there Iluvatar permitted the Valar to maintain upon earth an abiding place, a memorial of that which might have been if Morgoth had not cast his shadow on the world. This the Numenorians knew full well, and at times when all the air was clear, and the sun was in the east, they would look out and descry far off in the west, a city white shining on a distant shore, and a great harbor, and a tower. For in those days, the Numenorians were far-sighted. Yet even so, it was only the keenest eyes among them that could see this vision, from the mental Tarma, maybe, or from some tall ship that lay off their western coast, as far as it was lawful for them to go. For they did not dare to break the ban of the lords of the west. But the wise among them knew that this distant land was not indeed the blessed realm of Valinor, but was Avalone, the haven of the Eldar upon Erisea easternmost of the undying lands. And thence at times the firstborn still would come sailing to Numenor, in oarless boats, as white birds flying from the sunset. And they brought to Numenor many gifts, birds of song, and fragrant flowers, and herbs of great virtue, and a seedling they brought of Celeborn, the white tree that grew in the midst of Arisea. And that was in turn a seedling of Galathelion, the tree of Tuna, the image of Teleprion that Yavanna gave to the Eldar, in the Blessed Realm. And the tree grew and blossomed in the courts of the king in Armenelos, Nimloth it was named, and flowered in the evening, and the shadows of night it filled with its fragrance. Thus it was that because of the ban of the Valar, the voyages of the Dunedain in those days went ever eastward, and not westward, from the darkness of the north, to the heats of the south, and beyond the south, to the nether darkness. And they came even into the inner seas, and sailed about Middle-earth and glimpsed from their high prows, the gates of morning in the east. And the Dunedain came at times to the shores of the great lands, and they took pity on the forsaken world of Middle-earth. And the lords of Numenor set foot again upon the western shores, in the dark years of men, and none yet dared to withstand them. For most of the men of that age that sat under the shadow were now grown weak and fearful, and coming among them, the Numenorians taught them many things. Corn and wine they brought, and they instructed men in the growing of seed, and the grinding of grain, in the hewing of wood, and the shaping of stone, and in the ordering of their life, such as it might be in the lands of swift death, and little bliss. Then the men of Middle-earth were comforted, and here and there upon the western shores the houseless woods drew back, and men shook off the yoke of the offspring of Morgoth, and unlearned their terror of the dark. And they revered the memory of the tall sea kings, and when they had departed, they called them gods, hoping for their return. For at that time, the Numenorians dwelt never long in Middle-earth, nor made there as yet any habitation of their own. Eastward they must sail, but ever west their hearts returned. Now this yearning grew ever greater with the years, and the Numenorians began to hunger for the undying city that they saw from afar, and the desire of everlasting life, to escape from death and the ending of delight, grew strong upon them. And ever as their power and glory grew greater, their unquiet increased. For though the Valar had rewarded the Dunedain with long life, they could not take from them the weariness of the world that comes at last. And they died, even their kings of the seed of Arendil, and the span of their lives was brief in the eyes of the Eldar. Thus it was that a shadow fell upon them, in which maybe the will of Morgoth was at work, that still moved in the world. And the Numenorians began to murmur, at first in their hearts, and then in open words, against the doom of men, and most of all against the ban which forbade them to sail into the west. And they said among themselves, Why do the lords of the west sit there in peace unending, while we must die and go we know not whither, leaving our home and all that we have made? And the Eldar die not, even those that rebelled against the lords. And since we have mastered all seas, and no water is so wild or so wide that our ships cannot overcome it, why should we not go to Avalone and greet there our friends? And some there were who said, Why should we not go even to Amman, and taste there, were it but for a day, the bliss of the powers. Have we not become mighty among the people of Arda? 
The Eldar reported these words to the Valar, and Manwe was grieved, seeing a cloud gather on the noontide of Numenor. And so he sent messengers to the Dunedain, who spoke earnestly to the king, and to all who would listen, concerning the fate and fashion of the world. The doom of the world, they said, one alone can change who made it. And were you so to voyage that escaping all deceits and snares you came indeed to Amon, the blessed realm, little would it profit you, for it is not the land of Manwe that makes its people deathless, but the deathless that dwell therein have hallowed the land, and there you would but wither and grow weary the sooner, as moths in a light too strong and steadfast. But the king said, And does not Arendil my forefather live, or is he not in the land of Amon? To which they answered, You know that he has a fate apart and was a judge to the firstborn who die not. Yet this is also his doom that he can never return again to mortal lands, whereas you and your people are not of the firstborn, but are mortal men as Iluvatar made you. Yet it seems that you desire now to have the good of both kindreds, to sail to Valinor when you will, and to return when you please to your homes. That cannot be, nor can the Valar take away the gifts of Iluvatar. The Eldar, you say, are unpunished, and even those who rebelled do not die. Yet that is to them neither reward nor punishment, but the fulfillment of their being. They cannot escape, and are bound to this world, never to leave it so long as it lasts, for its life is theirs. And you are punished for the rebellion of men, you say, in which you had small part, and so it is that you die. But that was not at first appointed for a punishment. Thus you escape, and leave the world, and are not bound to it, in hope, or in weariness. Which of us therefore should envy the others? And the Numenorians answered, Why should we not envy the Valar, or even the least of the deathless? For of us is required a blind trust, and a hope without assurance, knowing not what lies before us in a little while. And yet we also love the earth, and would not lose it. Then the messenger said, Indeed the mind of Iluvatar concerning you is not known to the Valar, and he has not revealed all things that are to come. But this we hold to be true, that your home is not here, neither in the land of Amman, nor anywhere within the circles of the world. And the doom of men, that they should depart, was at first a gift of Iluvatar. It became a grief to them only because coming under the shadow of Morgoth, it seemed to them that they were surrounded by a great darkness, of which they were afraid. And some grew willful and proud and would not yield, until life was reft from them. We who bear the ever-mounting burden of the years do not clearly understand this, but if that grief is returned to trouble you, as you say, then we fear that the shadow arises once more and grows again in your hearts. Therefore, though you be the Dunedain, fairest of men, who escaped from the shadow of old and fought valiantly against it, we say to you, Beware, the will of Eru may not be gainsaid, and the Valar bid you earnestly not to withhold the trust to which you are called, lest soon it become again a bond by which you are constrained. Hope rather that in the end even the least of your desires shall have fruit. The love of Arda was set in your hearts by Iluvatar, and he does not plant to no purpose. Nonetheless, many ages of men unborn may pass ere that purpose is made known, and to you it will be revealed, and not to the Valar. These things took place in the days of Tarkiriatan the shipbuilder, and of Taratanamir, his son, and they were proud men, eager for wealth, and they laid the men of Middle-earth under tribute, taking now rather than giving. It was a Tarat and Amir that the messengers came, and he was the thirteenth king, and in his day the realm of Numenor had endured for more than two thousand years, and was come to the zenith of its bliss, if not yet of its power. But Atanamir was ill-pleased with the counsel of the messengers, and gave little heed to it, and the greater part of his people followed him, for they wished still to escape death in their own day, not waiting upon hope. And Atanamir lived to a great age, clinging to his life beyond the end of all joy, and he was the first of the Numenorians to do this, refusing to depart until he was witless and unmanned, and denying to his son the kingship at the height of his days. For the lords of Numenor had been wont to wed late in their long lives, and to depart and leave their mastery to their sons when these were come to full stature of body and mind. Then Taran Kalamon, son of Atanamir, became king, and he was of like mind, and in his day the people of Numenor became divided. On the one hand was the greater party, and they were called the king's men, and they grew proud and were estranged from the Valar and the Eldar, and on the other hand was the lesser party, and they were called the Elendili, the Elf Friends. For though they remained loyal indeed to the king in the house of Elros, they wished to keep their friendship of the Eldar, and they hearkened to the counsel of the lords of the West. Nonetheless, even they, who named themselves the faithful, did not wholly escape from the affliction of their people, and they were troubled by the thought of death. Thus the bliss of Westerness became diminished, but still its might and splendor increased. For the kings and their people had not yet abandoned wisdom, and if they loved the Valar no longer, at least they still feared them. They did not dare openly to break the banner to sail beyond the limits that had been appointed. Eastward still they steered their tall ships. 
But the fear of death grew ever darker upon them, and they delayed it by all means that they could, and they began to build great houses for their dead, while their wise men labored unceasingly to discover if they might the secret of recalling life, or at the least, of the prolonging of men's days. Yet they achieved only the art of preserving and corrupt, the dead flesh of men, and they filled all the land with silent tombs in which the thought of death was enshrined in the darkness. But those that lived turned the more eagerly to pleasure and revelry, desiring ever more goods and more riches. And after the days of Tar and Calamon, the offering of the first fruits to Eru was neglected, and men went seldom any more to the hallow upon the heights of Menaltarma in the midst of the land. Thus it came to pass in that time that the Numenorians first made great settlements upon the west shores of the ancient lands, for their own land seemed to them shrunken, and they had no rest or content therein, and they desired now wealth and dominion in Middle-earth, since the west was denied. Great harbors and strong towers they made, and there many of them took up their abode. But they appeared now rather as lords and masters, and gatherers of tribute, than as helpers and teachers. And the great ships of the Numenorians were borne east on the winds, and returned ever laden, and the power and majesty of their kings were increased. And they drank, and they feasted, and they clad themselves in silver and gold. In all this the elf friends had small part. They alone came now ever to the north, and the land of Gilgalad, keeping their friendship with the elves, and lending them aid against Sauron. And their haven was Pelagir, above the mouths of Anduin the Great. But the king's men sailed far away to the south, and the lordships and strongholds that they made have left many rumors in the legends of men. In this age, as is elsewhere told, Sauron arose again in Middle-earth, and grew, and turned back to the evil in which he was nurtured by Morgoth, becoming mighty in his service. Already in the days of Tarminister, the eleventh king of Numenor, he had fortified the land of Mordor, and had built there the tower of Barad-dûr, and thereafter he strove ever for the dominion of Middle-earth, to become a king over all kings, and as a god unto men. And Sauron hated the Numenorians because of the deeds of their fathers, and their ancient alliance with the elves, and allegiance to the Valar. Nor did he forget the aid that Tarminister had rendered to Gilgalad of old, in that time when the One Ring was forged, and there was war between Sauron and the elves in Eriador. Now he learned that the kings of Numenor had increased in power and splendor, and he hated them more, and he feared them, lest they should invade his lands, and wrest from him the dominion of the east. But for a long time he did not dare to challenge the lords of the sea, and he withdrew from the coasts. Yet Sauron was ever guileful, and it is said that among those whom he ensnared with the Nine Rings, three were great lords of Numenorian race. And when the Euleria rose that were the ring wraiths, and the strength of his terror and mastery over men had grown exceedingly great, he began to assail the strong places of the Numenorians upon the shores of the sea. In those days the shadow grew deeper upon Numenor, and the lives of the kings of the house of Elros waned because of their rebellion. But they hardened their hearts the more against the Valar, and the twentieth king took the scepter of his fathers, and he ascended the throne in the name of Adunakor, lord of the west, forsaking the elven tongues, and forbidding their use in his hearing. Yet in the scroll of kings, the name Hernumen was inscribed in the high elven speech, because of ancient custom, which the kings feared to break utterly, lest evil befall. Now this title seemed to the faithful over proud, being the title of the Valar, and their hearts were sorely tried between their loyalty to the house of Elros, and their reverence of the appointed powers. But worse was yet to come. For Argimilzor, the twenty-third king, was the greatest enemy of the faithful. In his day the white tree was untended, and began to decline, and he forbade utterly the use of the elven tongues, and punished those that welcomed the ships of Arisea, that still came secretly to the west shores of the land. Now the Elendili dwelt mostly in the western regions of Numenor, but Argimilzor commanded all that he could discover to be of this party, to remove from the west, and dwell in the east of the land. And there they were watched, and the chief dwelling of the faithful in the later days was thus nigh to the harbor of Romana. Thence many set sail to Middle-earth, seeking the northern coast where they might speak still with the Eldar, in the kingdom of Gilgalad. This was known to the kings, but they hindered it not, so long as the Elendili departed from their land and did not return. For they desired to end all friendship between their people and the Eldar of Aresia, whom they named the spies of the Valar, hoping to keep their deeds and their counsels hidden from the lords of the west. But all that they did was known to Manwe, and the Valar were wroth with the kings of Numenor, and gave them counsel and protection no more. And the ships of Aresia came never again out of the sunset, and the havens of Andunie were forlorn. Highest in honor after the house of the kings were the lords of Andunie, for they were of the line of Elros, being descended from Silmarion, daughter of Tarilendil, the fourth king of Numenor. And these lords were loyal to the kings, and revered them, and the lord of Andunie was ever among the chief counselors of the scepter. Yet also from the beginning they bore a special love to the Eldar, and reverence for the Valar. And as the shadow grew, they aided the faithful as they could. But for long they did not declare themselves openly, and sought rather to amend the hearts of the lords of the scepter with wiser counsels. There was a lady Inzelbeth, renowned for her beauty, and her mother was Lindorie, 
sister of Erendur, the lord of Andunie in the days of Arsakalthor, father of Argimilzor. Gimilzor took her to wife, though this was little to her liking, for she was in heart one of the faithful, being taught by her mother. But the kings and their sons were grown proud, and not to be gainsaid in their wishes. No love was there between Argimilzor and his queen, or between their sons. In Ziladun, the elder, was like his mother in mind as in body, but Gimilchad the younger, went with his father, unless he were yet prouder and more willful. To him Argimilzor would have yielded the scepter, rather than to the elder son, if the laws had allowed. But when Enziladun acceded to the scepter, he took again a title in the elven tongue as of old, calling himself Tarpalantir, for he was far-sighted both in eye and in mind. And even those that hated him feared his words as those of a seer. He gave peace for a while to the faithful, and he went once more at due seasons to the hallow of Eru upon the Meneltarma, which Argimilzor had forsaken. The white tree he tended again with honor, and he prophesied, saying that when the tree perished, then also would the line of the kings come to its end. But his repentance was too late to appease the anger of the Valar with the insolence of his fathers, of which the greater part of his people did not repent. And Gimilchad was strong and ungentle, and he took the leadership of those that had been called the king's men, and opposed the will of his brother as openly as he dared, and yet more in secret. Thus the days of Tarpalantir became darkened with grief, and he would spend much of his time in the west, and there ascended often the ancient tower of King Minister upon the hill of Oromet, whence he gazed westward in yearning, hoping to see, maybe, some sail upon the sea. But no ship came ever again from the west to Numenor, and Avalone was veiled in cloud. Now Gimilchad died two years before his two hundredth year, which was accounted an early death for one of Elros's line even in its waning. But this brought no peace to the king, for Pharazan, son of Gimilchad, had become a man yet more restless and eager for wealth and power than his father. He had fared often abroad, as a leader in the wars that the Numenorians made then in the coastlands of Middle-earth, seeking to extend their dominion over men, and thus he had won great renown as a captain both by land and by sea. Therefore when he came back to Numenor, hearing of his father's death, the hearts of the people were turned to him, for he brought with him great wealth, and was for the time free in his giving. And it came to pass that Tarpalantir grew weary of grief, and died. He had no son, but a daughter only, whom he named Miriel in the elven tongue. And to her now by right in the laws of the Numenorians came the scepter. But Pharazon took her to wife against her will, doing evil in this, and evil also in that the laws of Numenor did not permit the marriage, even in the royal house, of those more nearly akin than cousins in the second degree. And when they were wedded, he seized the scepter into his own hand, taking the title of Arpharazon, Tarkalian in the elven tongue, and the name of his queen he changed to Arzimraphel. The mightiest and proudest was Arpharazon the golden of all those that had wielded the scepter of the sea king since the foundation of Numenor. And four and twenty kings and queens had ruled the Numenorians before, and slept now in their deep tombs under the Mount of Meneltarma, lying upon beds of gold. And sitting upon his carven throne in the city of Armenelos in the glory of his power, he brooded darkly, thinking of war, for he had learned in Middle-earth of the strength of the realm of Sauron, and of his hatred of Westerness. And now there came to him the masters of ships and captains returning out of the east, and they reported that Sauron was putting forth his might, since Arpharazon had gone back from Middle-earth, and he was pressing down upon the cities by the coasts, and he had taken now the title of king of men. And he declared his purpose to drive the Numenorians into the sea, and destroy even Numenor, if that might be. Great was the anger of Arpharazon at these tidings, and as he pondered long in secret, his heart was filled with the desire of power unbounded, and the sole dominion of his will. And he determined without counsel of the Valar, or the aid of any wisdom but his own, that the title of king of men he would himself claim, and would compel Sauron to become his vassal and his servant. For in his pride he deemed that no king should ever arise so mighty as to vie with the heir of Arendil. Therefore he began in that time to smithy great hordes of weapons, and many ships of war he built and stored them with his arms. And when all was made ready, he himself set sail with his host into the east. And men saw his sails coming up out of the sunset, dyed as with scarlet and gleaming with red and gold, and fear fell upon the dwellers by the coast and they fled far away. But the fleet came at last to that place that was called Umbar, where was the mighty haven of the Numenorians, that no hand had wrought. Empty and silent were all the lands about when the king of the sea marched upon Middle-earth. For seven days he journeyed with banner and trumpet, and he came to a hill, and he went up, and he set there his pavilion and his throne, and he sat him down in the midst of the land, and the tents of his hosts were ranged all about him, blue, golden, and white, as a field of tall flowers. Then he sent forth heralds, and he commanded Sauron to come before him, and swear to him fealty. And Sauron came, even from his mighty tower of Barad-dûr he came, and he made no offer of battle. For he perceived that the power and majesty of the king of the sea surpassed all rumor of them, so that he could not trust even the greatest of his servants to withstand them. And he saw not his time yet to work his will with the Dunedain. And he was crafty, well skilled to gain what he would by subtlety, when force might not avail. Therefore he humbled himself before our Pharazon, and smoothed his tongue. And men wondered, for all that he said seemed fair and wise. But our Pharazon was not yet deceived, and it came into his mind that, for the better keeping of Sauron, he should be brought to Numenor, there to dwell as a hostage for himself and all his servants in Middle-earth. 
To this Sauron assented as one constrained, yet in his secret thought he received it gladly, for it chimed indeed with his desire. And Sauron passed over the sea, and looked upon the land of Numenor, and on the city of Armenelos in the days of its glory, and he was astounded. But his heart within was filled the more with envy and hate. Yet such was the cunning of his mind and mouth, and the strength of his hidden will, that ere three years had passed, he had become closest to the secret counsels of the king. For flattery sweet as honey was ever on his tongue, and knowledge he had of many things yet unrevealed to men. And seeing the favor that he had of their lord, all the counselors began to fawn upon him, save one alone, Amandil, lord of Andunie. Then slowly a change came over the land, and the hearts of the elf friends were sorely troubled, and many fell away out of fear, and although those that remained still called themselves the faithful, their enemies named them rebels. For now, having the ears of men, Sauron with many arguments gainsaid all that the Valar had taught, and he bade men think that in the world, in the east and even in the west, there lay yet many seas and many lands for their winning, wherein was wealth uncounted. And still, if they should at last come to the end of those lands and seas, beyond all lay the ancient darkness. And out of it the world was made, for darkness alone is worshipful, and the Lord thereof may yet make other worlds to the gifts to those that serve him, so that the increase of their power shall find no end. And Arpharazon said, Who is the Lord of the darkness? Then behind locked doors Sauron spoke to the king, and he lied, saying, It is he whose name is not now spoken, for the Valar have deceived you concerning him, putting forward the name of Eru, a phantom devised in the folly of their hearts, seeking to enchain men in servitude to themselves. For they are the oracle of this Eru, which speaks only what they will, but he that is their master shall yet prevail, and he will deliver you from this phantom, and his name is Melkor, Lord of all, giver of freedom, and he shall make you stronger than they. Then Arpharazon the king turned back to the worship of the dark, and of Melkor the lord thereof, at first in secret, but ere long openly, and in the face of his people, and they for the most part followed him. Yet there dwelt still a remnant of the faithful, as has been told, at Romena and in the country near, and other few there were here and there in the land. The chief among them, to whom they looked for leading and courage in evil days, was Amandil, counselor of the king, and his son Elendil, whose sons were Isildur and Anarion, then young men by the reckoning of Numenor. Amandil and Elendil were great ship captains, and they were of the line of Elros Tarminiatur, though not of the ruling house to whom belonged the crown, and the throne in the city of Armenelos. In the days of their youth together, Amandil had been dear to Farazon, and though he was of the elf friends, he remained in his council until the coming of Sauron. Now he was dismissed, for Sauron hated him above all others in Numenor. But he was so noble, and had been so mighty a captain of the sea, that he was still held in honor by many of the people, and neither the king nor Sauron dared to lay hands on him as yet. Therefore Amandil withdrew to Romena, and all that he trusted still to be faithful, he summoned to come thither in secret, for he feared that evil would now grow apace, and all the elf friends were in peril. And so it soon came to pass, for the mental Tarma was utterly deserted in those days, and though not even Sauron dared to defile the high place, yet the king would let no man, upon pain of death, ascend to it, not even those of the faithful, who kept Iluvatar in their hearts. And Sauron urged the king to cut down the white tree, Nimloth the Fair, that grew in his courts, for it was a memorial of the Eldar, and of the light of Valinor. At the first the king would not assent to this, since he believed that the fortunes of his house were bound up with the tree, as was forespoken by Tar Palantir. Thus in his folly, he who now hated the Eldar and the Valar, vainly clung to the shadow of the old allegiance of Numenor. But when Amandil heard rumor of the evil purpose of Sauron, he was grieved to the heart, knowing that in the end, Sauron would surely have his will. Then he spoke to Elendil and the sons of Elendil, recalling the tale of the trees of Valinor. And Isildur said no word, but went out by night and did a deed for which he was afterwards renowned. For he passed alone in disguise to Armenelos, and to the courts of the king, which were now forbidden to the faithful. And he came to the place of the tree, which was forbidden to all by the orders of Sauron. And the tree was watched day and night by guards in his service. Nimloth was dark and bore no bloom, for it was late in the autumn, and its winter was nigh, and Isildur passed through the guards, and took from the tree a fruit that hung upon it, and turned to go. But the guard was aroused, and he was assailed, and fought his way out, receiving many wounds, and he escaped, and because he was disguised, it was not discovered who had laid hands on the tree. But Isildur came at last hardly back to Romena, and delivered the fruit to the hands of Amandil, ere his strength failed him. Then the fruit was planted in secret, and it was blessed by Amandil, and a shoot arose from it, and sprouted in the spring. But when its first leaf opened then, Isildur, who had lain long and come near to death, 
arose and was troubled no more by his wounds. None too soon was this done, for after the assault, the king yielded to Sauron and felled the white tree and turned them wholly away from the allegiance of his fathers. But Sauron caused to be built upon the hill in the midst of the city of the Numenorians, Armenelos the Golden, and it was in the form of a circle at the base, and there the walls were fifty feet in thickness, and the width of the base was five hundred feet across the center, and the walls rose from the ground five hundred feet, and they were crowned with a mighty dome. And that dome was roofed all with silver, and rose glittering in the sun, so that the light of it could be seen afar off. But soon the light was darkened, and the silver became black. For there was an altar of fire in the midst of the temple, and in the topmost of the dome there was a louver, whence there issued a great smoke. And the first fire upon the altar Sauron kindled with the hewn wood of Nimloth, and it crackled, and was consumed. But men marveled at the reek that went up from it, so that the land lay under a cloud for seven days, until slowly it passed into the west. Thereafter the fire and smoke went up without ceasing, for the power of Sauron daily increased. And in that temple, with spilling of blood and torment, and great wickedness, men made sacrifice to Melkor, that he should release them from death. And most often from among the faithful, they chose their victims. Yet never openly on the charge that they would not worship Melkor, the giver of freedom, rather was cause sought against them that they hated the king, and were his rebels, or that they plotted against their kin, devising lies and poisons. Yet those were bitter days, and hate brings forth hate. But for all this, death did not depart from the land, rather it came sooner, and more often, and in many dreadful guises. For whereas aforetime men had grown slowly old, and had lain them down in the end to sleep, when they were weary at last of the world, now madness and sickness assailed them, and yet they were afraid to die, and go out into the dark, the realm of the Lord that they had taken, and they cursed themselves in their agony. And men took weapons in those days, and slew one another for little cause, for they were become quick to anger, and Sauron, or those whom he had bound to himself, went about the land setting man against man, so that the people murmured against the kings and the lords, or against any that had aught that they had not, and the men of power took cruel revenge. Nonetheless for long it seemed to the Numenorians that they prospered, and if they were not increased in happiness, yet they grew more strong, and their rich men ever richer. For with the aid and counsel of Sauron, they multiplied their possessions, and they devised engines, and they built ever greater ships, and they sailed now with power and armory to Middle-earth, and they came no longer as bringers of gifts, nor even as rulers, but as fierce men of war. And they hunted the men of Middle-earth, and took their goods and enslaved them, and many they slew cruelly upon their altars. For they built in their fortresses temples and great tombs in those days. And men feared them, and the memory of the kindly kings of the ancient days faded from the world, and was darkened by many a tale of dread. Thus Arpharazon, king of the land of the star, grew to the mightiest tyrant that had yet been in the world since the reign of Morgoth, though in truth Sauron ruled all from behind the throne. But the years passed, and the king felt the shadow of death approach, as his days lengthened, and he was filled with fear and wrath. Now came the hour that Sauron had prepared, and long had awaited. And Sauron spoke to the king, saying that his strength was now so great, that he might think to have his will in all things, and be subject to no command or ban. And he said, The Valar have possessed themselves of the land where there is no death, and they lie to you concerning it, hiding it as best they may, because of their avarice and their fear, lest the kings of men should wrest from them the deathless realm, and rule the world in their stead. And though, doubtless, the gift of life unending is not for all, but only for such as are worthy, being men of might and pride and great lineage, yet against all justice is it done that this gift, which is his due, should be withheld from the king of kings, Arpharazon, mightiest of the sons of earth, to whom Manwe alone can be compared, if even he. But great kings do not brook denials, and take what is their due. Then Arpharazon, being besotted, and walking under the shadow of death, for his span was drawing towards its end, hearkened to Sauron, and he began to ponder in his heart how he might make war upon the Valar. He was long preparing this design, and he spoke not openly of it, yet it could not be hidden from all. And Amandil, becoming aware of the purposes of the king, was dismayed and filled with great dread, for he knew that men could not vanquish the Valar in war, and that ruin must come upon the world if this war were not stayed. Therefore he called his son, Elendil, and he said to him, The days are dark, and there is no hope for men, for the faithful are few. Therefore I am minded to try that counsel which our forefather Arendil took of old, to sail into the west, be their ban or no, and to speak to the Valar, even to Manwe himself, if may be, and beseech his aid, ere all is lost. Would you betray the king, said Elendil, for you know well the charge that they make against us, that we are traitors and spies, and that until this day it has been false. If I thought that Manwe needed such a messenger, said Amandil, I would betray the king, for there is but one loyalty from which no man can be absolved in heart for any cause. But it is for mercy upon men and their deliverance from Sauron the deceiver that I would plead, since some at least have remained faithful. And as for the ban, I will suffer in myself the penalty, lest all my people should become guilty. But what think you, my father, is like to befall those of your house whom you leave behind, when your deed becomes known? It must not become known, 
said Amandil. I will prepare my going in secret, and I will set sail into the east, whither daily the ships depart from our havens. And thereafter, as wind and chance may allow, I will go about, through south or north, back into the west, and seek what I may find. But for you and your folk, my son, I counsel that you should prepare yourselves other ships, and put aboard all such things as your hearts cannot bear to part with. And when the ships are ready, you should lie in the haven of Romana, and give out among men that you purpose, when you see your time, to follow me into the east. Amandil is no longer so dear to our kinsmen upon the throne that he will grieve over much, if we seek to depart, for a season, or for good. But let it not be seen that you intend to take many men, or he will be troubled, because of the war that he now plots, for which he will need all the force that he may gather. Seek out the faithful that are known still to be true, and let them join you in secret, if they are willing to go with you, and share in your design. And what shall that design be? said Elendil, to meddle not in the war, and to watch, answered Amandil. Until I return, I can say no more, but it is most like that you shall fly from the land of the star with no star to guide you, for that land is defiled. Then you shall lose all that you have loved, for tasting death and life, seeking a land of exile elsewhere. But east or west, the Valar alone can say. Then Amandil said farewell to all his household, as one that is about to die. For it may well prove that you will see me never again, and that I shall show you no such sign as Arendil showed you long ago, but hold you ever in readiness, for the end of the world that we have known is now at hand. It is said that Amandil set sail in a small ship at night, and steered first eastward, and then went about and passed into the west, and he took with him three servants, dear to his heart, and never again were they heard of by word or sign in this world, nor is there any tale or guess of their fate. Men could not a second time be saved by any such embassy, and for the treason of Numenor there was no easy absolving. But Elendil did all that his father had bidden, and his ships lay off the east coast of the land, and the faithful put aboard their wives and their children, and their heirlooms, and great store of goods. Many things there were of beauty and power, such as the Numenorians had contrived in the days of their wisdom, vessels and jewels, and scrolls of lore written in scarlet and black, and seven stones they had, the gift of the Eldar. But in the ship of Isildur was guarded the young tree, the scion of Nimloth the Fair. Thus Elendil held himself in readiness, and did not meddle in the evil deeds of those days, and ever he looked for a sign that did not come. Then he journeyed in secret to the western shores, and gazed out over the sea, for sorrow and yearning were upon him, and he greatly loved his father. But naught could be descry, but the fleets of Arpharazon gathering in the havens of the west. Now aforetime in the Isle of Numenor, the weather was ever apt to the needs and liking of men, rain in due season, and ever in measure, and sunshine, now warmer, now cooler, and winds from the sea. And when the wind was in the west, it seemed to many that it was filled with a fragrance, fleeting but sweet, as of flowers that bloom forever in undying meads, and have no names on mortal shores. But all this was now changed, for the sky itself was darkened, and there were storms of rain and hail in those days, and violent winds, and ever and anon a great ship of the Numenorians would founder, and return not to haven, though such a grief had not till then befallen them, since the rising of the star. And out of the west there would come at times a great cloud in the evening, shaped as it were an eagle, with pinions spread to the north and the south, and slowly it would loom up, blotting out the sunset, and then uttermost night would fall upon Numenor, and some of the eagles bore lightning beneath their wings, and thunder echoed between sea and cloud. Then men grew afraid. Behold the eagles of the Lord of the West, they cried. The eagles of Manwe are come upon Numenor, and they fell upon their faces. Then some few would repent for a season, but others hardened their hearts, and they shook their fists at heaven, saying, The lords of the West have plotted against us. They strike first, the next blow shall be ours. These words the king himself spoke, but they were devised by Sauron. Now the lightnings increased, and slew men upon the hills, and in the fields, and in the streets of the city, and a fiery bolt smote the dome of the temple, and shore it asunder, and it was wreathed in flame. But the temple itself was unshaken, and Sauron stood there upon the pinnacle and defied the lightning, and was unharmed. And in that hour men called him a god, and did all that he would. When therefore the last portent came, they heeded it little. For the land shook under them, and a groaning as of thunder underground was mingled with the roaring of the sea, and smoke issued from the peak of the metal Tarma. But all the more did Arpharazon press on with his armament. In that time the fleets of the Numenorians darkened the sea upon the west of the land, and they were like an archipelago of a thousand isles. Their masts were as a forest upon the mountains, and their sails like a brooding cloud, and their banners were golden and black. And all things waited upon the word of Arpharazon. And Sauron withdrew into the inmost circle of the temple, and men brought him victims to be burned. Then the eagles of the lords of the west came up out of the dayfall, and they were arrayed as for battle, advancing in a line the end of which diminished beyond sight, and as they came their wings spread ever wider, grasping the sky. But the west burned red behind them, and they glowed beneath, as though they were lit with a flame of great anger, so that all Numenor was illuminated as with a smoldering fire, and men looked upon the faces of their fellows, and it seemed to them that they were red with wrath. 
Then Arpharazon hardened his heart, and he went aboard his mighty ship, Alcarondas, Castle of the Sea. Many oared it was, and many masted, golden and sable, and upon it the throne of Arpharazon was set. Then he did on his panoply, and his crown, and let raise his standard, and he gave the signal for the raising of the anchors, and in that hour the trumpets of Numenor outrang the thunder. Thus the fleets of the Numenorians moved against the menace of the west, and there was little wind, but they had many oars, and many strong slaves to row beneath the lash. The sun went down, and there came a great silence. Darkness fell upon the land, and the sea was still, while the world waited for what would be tide. Slowly the fleets passed out of the sight of the watchers in the havens, and their lights faded, and night took them, and in the morning they were gone. For a wind arose in the east, and it wafted them away, and they broke the ban of the Valar, and sailed into forbidden seas, going up with war against the Deathless, to wrest from them everlasting life within the circles of the world. But the fleets of Arpharazon came up out of the deeps of the sea, and encompassed Avalone and all the Isle of Erisea. And the Eldar mourned, for the light of the setting sun was cut off by the cloud of the Numenorians. And at last, Arpharazon came even to Amman, the blessed realm, and the coasts of Valinor. And still all was silent, and doom hung by a thread. For Arpharazon wavered at the end, and almost he turned back. His heart misgave him when he looked upon the soundless shores, and saw Taniquetil shining, whiter than snow, colder than death, silent, immutable, terrible as the shadow of the light of Iluvatar. But pride was now his master, and at last he left his ship and strode upon the shore, claiming the land for his own, if none should do battle for it. And a host of the Numenorians encamped in might about Tuna, whence all the Eldar had fled. Then Manwe upon the mountain called upon Iluvatar, and for that time the Valar laid down their government of Arda. But Iluvatar showed forth his power, and he changed the fashion of the world, and a great chasm opened in the sea between Numenor and the deathless lands, and the waters flowed into it, and the noise and smoke of the cataracts went up to heaven, and the world was shaken, and all the fleets of the Numenorians were drawn down into the abyss, and swallowed up forever. But Arpharazon the king, and the mortal warriors that had set foot upon the land of Amman, were buried under falling hills. There it is said that they lie imprisoned in the caves of the Forgotten, until the last battle, and the day of doom. But the land of Amman and Erisea of the Eldar were taken away and removed beyond the reach of men forever. The land of Gift, Numenor of the Kings, Elena of the Star of Arendil, was utterly destroyed, for it was nigh to the east of the Great Rift, and its foundations were overturned, and it fell and went down into darkness, and is no more. And there is not now upon earth any place abiding where the memory of a time without evil is preserved. For Iluvatar cast back the great seas west of Middle-earth, and the empty lands east of it, and new lands and new seas were made, and the world was diminished, for Valinor and Erisea were taken from it, into the realm of hidden things. In an hour unlooked for by men this doom befell, on the nine and thirtieth day since the passing of the fleets. Then suddenly fire burst from the Menaltarma, and there came a mighty wind and a tumult of the earth, and the sky reeled, and the hills slid, and Numenor went down into the sea, with all its children, and its wives, and its maidens, and its ladies proud, and all its gardens, and its halls, and its towers, its tombs and its riches, and its jewels and its webs and its things painted and carven, and its laughter and its mirth, and its music, its wisdom and its lore, they vanished forever. And last of all the mounting wave, green and cold and plumed with foam, climbing over the land, took to its bosom Tarmiriel the queen, fairer than silver, or ivory, or pearls. Too late she strove to ascend the steep ways of the Menaltarma to the holy place, for the waters overtook her, and her cry was lost in the roaring of the wind. But whether or no it were that Amandiel came indeed to Valinor, and Manwe hearkened to his prayers, by grace of the Valar Elendil and his sons and their people, were spared from the ruin of that day. For Elendil had remained in Romana, refusing the summons of the king when he set forth to war, and avoiding the soldiers of Sauron that came to seize him, and drag him to the fires of the temple, he went aboard his ship and stood off from the shore, waiting on the time. There he was protected by the land from the great draught of the sea that drew all towards the abyss, and afterwards he was sheltered from the first fury of the storm. But when the devouring wave rolled over the land and Numenor toppled to its fall, then he would have been overwhelmed and would have deemed it the lesser grief to perish. For no wrench of death could be more bitter than the loss and agony of that day. But the great wind took him, wilder than any wind that men had known, roaring from the west, and it swept his ships far away, and it rent their sails and snapped their masts, hunting the unhappy men like straws upon the water. Nine ships there were, four for Elendil, and for Isildur three, and for Anarion two, and they fled before the black gale out of the twilight of doom into the darkness of the world, and the deeps rose beneath them in towering anger, and waves like unto mountains moving with great caps of writhen snow, bore them up amid the wreckage of the clouds, and after many days cast them away upon the shores of Middle-earth, and all the coasts and seaward regions of the western world suffered great change and ruin in that time. For the seas invaded the lands, and shores foundered, and ancient isles were drowned, and new isles were uplifted, and hills crumbled, and rivers were turned into strange courses. Elendil and his sons after founded kingdoms in Middle-earth, 
And though their lore and craft was but an echo of that which had been, ere Sauron came to Numenor, yet very great it seemed to the wild men of the world. And much is said in other lore of the deeds of the heirs of Elendil, in the age that came after her, and of their strife with Sauron, that not yet was ended. For Sauron himself was filled with great fear at the wrath of the Valar, and the doom that Eru laid upon sea and land. It was greater far than aught he had looked for, hoping only for the death of the Numenorians and the defeat of their proud king. And Sauron, sitting in his black seat in the midst of the temple, had laughed when he heard the trumpets of Arpharazon sounding for battle. And again he had laughed when he heard the thunder of the storm. And a third time, even as he laughed at his own thought, thinking what he would do now in the world, being rid of the Adain forever, he was taken in the midst of his mirth, and his seat and his temple fell into the abyss. But Sauron was not of mortal flesh, and though he was robbed now of that shape in which he had wrought so great an evil, so that he could never again appear fair to the eyes of men, yet his spirit arose out of the deep, and passed as a shadow in a black wind over the sea, and came back to Middle-earth, and to Mordor, that was his home. There he took up again his great ring in Barad-dûr, and dwelt there, dark and silent, until he wrought himself a new guise, an image of malice and hatred made visible, and the eye of Sauron the terrible few could endure. But these things come not into the tale of the drowning of Numenor, of which now all is told, and even the name of that land perished, and men spoke thereafter not of Elena, nor of Andor, the gift that was taken away, nor of Numenor on the confines of the world. But the exiles on the shores of the sea, if they turned towards the west in the desire of their hearts, spoke of Marnu Falmar that was whelmed in the waves, Akalabeth the downfallen, Atalante, and the Eldaran tongue. And now you are aware of all the deeds of Sauron the Great and Terrible that were not given mention in tales you might be familiar with. In comparison to what we know of his accomplishments during the story of the Lord of the Rings, what he did in his past may seem gargantuan in proportion, and it surely is. Sauron at the time of Frodo's quest was more so the puppet master than anything. Whereas in ages prior Sauron walked amongst men and elves alike to sow discord and corrupt their peoples, now he resided only in Barad-dûr in the Land of Shadows, for much of his power, as we know well, is tied to the One Ring. And while the Nazgul's relentless hunting of Frodo, Saruman's alliance with him and his machinations, and the direction of his armies towards the kingdoms of elves and men, to decimate them, so he might finally rule over all his dread eye catches in his vision, can all be attributed to Sauron's leadership, and wherever suffering abounded during this tale, the works of Sauron can be found. Indeed. Though Sauron's power was significantly diminished, because he no longer possessed his ring, his might was no less in that the allegiance of all things fell and cruel lay solely with him and his cause, and the threat of even a Sauron reduced in power should never be underestimated, as so long as the ring endures, Sauron endures. But the might of the second greatest evil to ever walk upon Arda was ultimately eliminated by a power of comparably small stature, and with the destruction of the One Ring, Sauron was doomed to haunt the ethereal plane in between the worlds of the living and the dead as a formless, powerless shadow, a fate that is echoed by his demise, as was seen by the armies gathered outside the Black Gate as Gollum fell into the fires of Mount Doom. As the captains gazed south to the land of Mordor, it seemed to them that, black against the pall of cloud, there rose a huge shape of shadow, impenetrable, lightning-crowned, filling all the sky. Enormous it reared above the world, and stretched out towards them a vast threatening hand, terrible, but impotent. For even as it leaned over them, a great wind took it, and it was all blown away, and passed, and then a hush fell. Though this may not have been how many envisioned his downfall, the surety of that downfall was always guaranteed, no matter how much Sauron fought against the powers that be. It was not Frodo's journey to Mount Doom that sealed Sauron's fate, but his dedication to evil and his refusal to face the judgment of the Valar. Though the Valar likely had a bad taste in their mouth after they pardoned Morgoth and he turned back to evil, it's likely that had Sauron submitted to them, repented, and served out whatever sentence they gave him, he could have returned to Valinor and taken his place amongst his brethren once again. But perhaps it was the fear of his dark master, whose punishments would be legendary in nature, and the lies he told of the Valar's cruelty that caused Sauron to fear for his very life should he return to Valinor. And so to Sauron, a mind poisoned by evil, he saw only one path forward that could save him from the pain he surely thought awaited him in Valinor, to become the new dark master of Arda. As we've already discussed, Sauron came to believe that the Valar had forsaken Middle-earth, and thus he figured so long as he could conquer its people, he could rule unopposed and live out the rest of eternity as master of the world. Now as far as the inner workings of Sauron's mind and evil intent is concerned, we have an amazing breakdown of this subject that was given to us in Morgoth's ring. And keeping everything we've learned about Sauron so far in mind, these observations will help us better understand the differences between him and his former master, as well as his powers, motivation, and goals. Sauron was greater, effectively, in the Second Age than Morgoth at the end of the First. Why? 
because, though he was far smaller by natural stature, he had not yet fallen so low. Eventually, he also squandered his power of being in the endeavor to gain control of others, but he was not obliged to expend so much of himself. To gain domination over Arda, Morgoth had let most of his being pass into the physical constituents of the earth, hence all things that were born on earth and lived on and by it, beasts or plants or incarnate spirits, were liable to be stained. Morgoth at the time of the War of the Jewels had become permanently incarnate. For this reason he was afraid, and waged the war almost entirely by means of devices, or of subordinates, and dominated creatures. Sauron, however, inherited the corruption of Arda, and only spent his much more limited power on the rings, for it was the creatures of Earth, in their minds and wills, that he desired to dominate. In this way, Sauron was also wiser than Melkor Morgoth. Sauron was not a beginner of discord, and he probably knew more of the music than did Melkor, whose mind had always been filled with his own plans and devices, and gave little attention to other things. The time of Melkor's greatest power, therefore, was in the physical beginnings of the world, a vast demiurgic lust for power, and the achievement of his own will and designs, on a great scale. And later after things had become more stable, Melkor was more interested in and capable of dealing with a volcanic eruption, for example, than with, say, a tree. It is indeed probable that he was simply unaware of the minor or more delicate productions of Yavanna, such as small flowers. Thus, as Morgoth, when Melkor was confronted by the existence of other inhabitants of Arda, with other wills and intelligences, he was enraged by the mere fact of their existence, and his only notion of dealing with them was by physical force, or the fear of it. His sole ultimate object was their destruction. Elves, and still more men, he despised because of their weakness, that is, their lack of physical force, or power over matter but he was also afraid of them. He was aware, at any rate originally when still capable of rational thought, that he could not annihilate them, that is, destroy their being, but their physical life and incarnate form, because increasingly to his mind, that was the only thing that was worth considering. Or if such things were forced upon his attention, he was angry and hated them, as coming from other minds than his own, Melkor could not, of course, annihilate anything of matter. He could only ruin or destroy or corrupt the forms given to matter by other minds in their sub-creative activities. For this became so far advanced in lying, that he lied even to himself, and pretended that he could destroy them, and rid Arda of them altogether. Hence his endeavor always to break wills and subordinate them to or absorb them into his own will and being, and rid Arda of them altogether. Hence his endeavor always to break wills, and subordinate them to, or absorb them into his own will and being, before destroying their bodies. This was sheer nihilism, and negation its one ultimate object. Morgoth would no doubt, if he had been victorious, have ultimately destroyed even his own creatures, such as the orcs, when they had served his sole purpose in using them, the destruction of elves and men. Melkor's final impotence and despair lay in this, that whereas the Valar, and in their degree elves and men, could still love Arda Mard, that is Arda with a Melkor ingredient, and could still heal this or that hurt, or produce from its very marring, from its state as it was, things beautiful and lovely, Melkor could do nothing with Arda, which was not from his own mind, and was interwoven with the work and thoughts of others. Even left alone, he could only have gone raging on till all was leveled again into a formless chaos. And yet even so he would have been defeated, because it would still have existed, independent of his own mind, and a world in potential. Sauron had never reached this stage of nihilistic madness. He did not object to the existence of the world, so long as he could do what he liked with it. He still had the relics of positive purposes that descended from the good of the nature in which he began. It had been his virtue, and therefore also the cause of his fall, and of his relapse, that he loved order and coordination, and disliked all confusion and wasteful friction. It was the apparent will and power of Melkor to effect his designs quickly and masterfully that had first attracted Sauron to him. Sauron had, in fact, been very like Saruman, and so still understood him quickly and could guess what he would be likely to think and do, even without the aid of Palantiri or of spies, whereas Gandalf eluded and puzzled him. But like all minds of this cast, Sauron's love originally, or later mere understanding of other individual intelligences, was correspondingly weaker, and though the only real good in, or rational motive for, all this ordering and planning and organization was the good of all inhabitants of Arda, even admitting Sauron's reason, he himself came to fear death, the destruction of his assumed bodily form, above everything, and he sought to avoid any kind of injury to his own form. His plans, the idea coming from his own isolated mind, became the sole object of his will, and an end, the end, in itself. Morgoth had no plan, unless destruction and reduction to nil of a world, in which he had only a share, can be called a plan. But this is, of course, a simplification of the situation. Sauron had not served Morgoth, even in his last stages, without becoming infected by his lust for destruction and his hatred of God, which must end in nihilism. Sauron could not, of course, be a sincere atheist. Though one of the minor spirits created before the world, he knew Eru according to his measure. 
he probably deluded himself with the notion that the Valar, having failed, Eru had simply abandoned Ea. It would appear that he interpreted the change of the world at the downfall of Numenor when Amon was removed from the physical world in this sense. Valar and elves were removed from effective control, and men under God's curse and wrath. If he thought about the Astari, especially Saruman and Gandalf, he imagined them as emissaries from the Valar, seeking to establish their lost power again and colonize Middle-earth as a mere effort of defeated imperialists without knowledge or sanction of Eru. His cynicism, which sincerely regarded the motives of Manwe as precisely the same as his own, seemed fully justified in Saruman. Gandalf he did not understand, but certainly he had already become evil, enough to imagine that his different behavior was due simply to weaker intelligence and lack of firm masterful purpose. He was only a rather cleverer Radagast, cleverer because it is more profitable and more productive of power to become absorbed in the study of people than of animals. Sauron was not a sincere atheist, but he preached atheism because it weakened resistance to himself and he had ceased to fear God's action in Arda, as was seen in the case of Arpharazon. But there was seen the effect of Melkor upon Sauron. He spoke of Melkor, in Melkor's own terms, as a god, or even as god. This may have been the residue of a state which was in a sense, a shadow of good. The ability once in Sauron at least to admire, or admit the superiority of a being, other than himself. But his capability of corrupting other minds, and even engaging their service, was a residue from the fact that his original desire for order had really envisaged the good estate, especially the physical well-being of his subjects. Melkor, and still more Sauron himself afterwards, both profited by his darkened shadow of good and the services of worshippers. But it may be doubted whether even such a shadow of good was still sincerely operative in Sauron by that time. His cunning motive is probably best expressed thus. It is best to propound another unseen object of allegiance and another hope of benefits. Propound to him a lord who will sanction what he desires, apparently a defeated rival for world power. Now a mere hostage can hardly propound himself, but as the former servant and disciple of Melkor, the worship of Melkor will raise him from hostage to high priest. But though Sauron's whole true motive was the destruction of the Numenorians, this was a particular matter of revenge upon Arpharazon for humiliation. Sauron, unlike Morgoth, would have been content for the Numenorians to exist as his own subjects, and indeed, he used the great many of them that he corrupted to his allegiance. Sauron achieved even greater control over his orcs than Morgoth had done. He was, of course, operating on a smaller scale, and he had no enemies so great and so fell as were the Noldor and their might in the Elder Days. But he had also inherited from those days difficulties, such as the diversity of the orcs in breed and language, and the feuds among them, while in many places in Middle-earth, after the fall of Thangaradrim and during the concealment of Sauron, the orcs recovering from their helplessness had set up petty realms of their own, and few orcs ever did so in the Elder Days, and at no time would any orc treat with an elf. For one thing Morgoth had achieved was to convince the orcs beyond refutation that the elves were crueler than themselves, taking captives only for amusement or to eat them as the orcs would do at need. The orcs had become accustomed to independence. Nonetheless, Sauron in time managed to unite them all in unreasoning hatred of the elves and of men, while the orcs of his own trained armies were so completely under his will that they would sacrifice themselves without hesitation at his command. And he proved even more skillful than his master also in the corruption of men who were beyond the reach of the wise and in reducing them to a vassalage in which they would march with the orcs and vie with them in cruelty and destruction. It is thus probably to Sauron that we may look for a solution of the problem of chronology. Though of immensely smaller native power than his master, he remained less corrupt, cooler, and more capable of calculation, at least in the elder days, and before he was bereft of his lord, and fell into the folly of imitating him, and endeavoring to become himself supreme lord of Middle-earth. While Morgoth still stood, Sauron did not seek his own supremacy, but worked and schemed for another, desiring the triumph of Melkor, whom in the beginning he had adored. He thus was often able to achieve things, first conceived by Melkor, which his master did not or could not complete in the furious haste of his malice. We may assume, then, that the idea of breeding the orcs came from Melkor, not at first maybe so much for the provision of servants or the infantry of his wars of destruction as for the defilement of the children and the blasphemous mockery of the designs of Eru. The details of the accomplishment of this wickedness were, however, left mainly to the subtleties of Sauron. In that case, the conception and mind of the orcs may go far back into the night of Melkor's thought, though the beginning of their actual breeding must await the awakening of men. When Melkor was made captive, Sauron escaped and lay hid in Middle-earth, and it can in this way be understood how the breeding of the orcs, no doubt already begun, went on with increasing speed during the age when the Noldor dwelt in Amman, so that when they returned to Middle-earth, they found it already infested with this plague to the torment of all that dwelt there, elves, or men, or dwarves. 
It was Sauron also, who secretly repaired Angband for the help of his master when he returned. And there the dark places underground were already manned with hosts of the orcs, before Melkor came back at last, as Morgoth, the black enemy, and sent them forth to bring ruin upon all that was fair. And though Angband has fallen, and Morgoth is removed, still they come forth from the lightless places in the darkness of their hearts, and the earth is withered under their pitiless feet. Now that's quite the insight into Sauron's character. And with all that we've learned throughout this video, I feel we now have a pretty good handle on Sauron and his overall moral character. In the beginning, Sauron was a benevolent force of heavenly virtue, like any other I knew her. But his birth from the portion of Eru's mind that dealt with order and control, slowly but surely slipped into that of domination and enslavement. This portion of Sauron's story is a great reminder of the ease with which one's desire for order can be corrupted into a desire to dominate, and this is a common unfortunate occurrence in the world of sapient beings. And there is a fine line between the imposition of order to structure one's world in a way that benefits all, and the tyranny that seeks to control every aspect of the lives of others for one's own personal power and the vision you may have for the world. And in his pursuit of absolute power, Sauron became adept in all things cruel and barbaric, a master of murder, espionage, torture, and manipulation, a totally self-centered being without a shred of empathy or mercy. He was the deceiver, the overlord, the great manipulator, and the refiner of the great evil that had been unleashed upon this land by his former master. If Morgoth was a force of nature, like the fires of Mount Doom, Sauron is the entity attempting to tame that force and use it as a tool to further his own designs. We've seen it mentioned many times that Morgoth's residual influence still affects the world. And just as Sauron was a great wielder of his master's dread power during his service to him, he was ever the craftsman, a being who molded that power to his own designs after Morgoth departed, a twisted adherent to the ways of his first master, Auli the Smith. But as horrifying as Sauron's actions and goals are, there is a significant difference between him and his master that marks Sauron as the lesser of two monumental evils, Sauron's desire to rule. Sauron was never trying to eradicate the peoples of this land. In fact, had they all submitted to him readily, I doubt he would have felt the need to wage war against them in the various ways he did. But because they resisted, many would perish. But a king must have subjects to rule over, and had Sauron been victorious, the destiny of the remaining peoples of Middle-earth would have been slavery. Every living creature that opposed him, just as his faithful servants already were, would have become slaves to Sauron, the orcs, corrupt men, and whatever other fell creatures he placed as lords above the bound peoples of Middle-earth. But slavery, not death, was what awaited all who Sauron ruled. In a lot of ways, such a fate would be preferable to what Morgoth had in store for Middle-earth, as slavery is a bond that can be broken, but the utter death and destruction sought by Melkor is something that no living being could ever heal from. So while Sauron may appear more cruel, due to the more personal touch he put into his rule and in his machinations, the mad destructive force of Morgoth was a far more menacing threat than the tyranny of Sauron. Regardless, slavery to a Dark Lord is not an existence any should have to suffer. While Sauron never achieved true mastery over Middle-earth, the crimes he committed in his pursuit of it are immeasurable. How many thousands of men, women, and children of the elves, men, and dwarves were ended due to Sauron's megalomania? How many lands were irrevocably damaged and the homes of its peoples destroyed as endeavored to enslave every creature that drew breath upon the earth? The numbers are staggering, and as we've discussed in depth throughout this video, both Sauron's actions personal and impersonal spelled death and misery for countless individuals throughout several millennia. And though he began as a divine, uncorrupted creature, by the time of his final destruction, he's more than earned his designation as an irredeemable monster who should be granted not even a shred of mercy. Just like the evil of his master, the evil of Sauron cannot be wholly cured, nor made as if it had not been. And so long as the world endures, the memory of these dread masters of darkness will unfortunately plague the children of Iluvatar. And so this is Sauron, dark lord and once hopeful master of all creation. And I hope that this video has given you great insight into all the sinister aspects of this wretched figure, a being who altered the course of Arda's history for the worse. But just as Morgoth is prophesied to return, so too shall Sauron at the end of days. And when the final battle is fought, and the powers of evil suffer their true defeat, the world shall be remade, and all memory of the suffering wrought by these powers will fade into the void where they belong. And evil will be remembered exactly for what it is, folly, and nothing more. Thank you all for tuning in to this episode of Analyzing Evil, and I hope you've enjoyed. What are your thoughts on Sauron? Did I miss anything? Let me know down below, and leave a suggestion for a villain you'd like to see featured while you're at it. If you like this video, hit that thumbs up button, and make sure to subscribe if you haven't already. A big thank you to all of my subscribers, to my patrons, and to anyone who's decided to honor me with a super thank, and a most vile thank you to those whose names you're seeing on screen now.
join the channel's Discord server and subreddit to interact with myself and the community, and follow me on the social media platforms listed below to keep up with the channel. As always, thanks for watching, and I'll be seeing you soon.